Part 2. The Paulicians and Abbreviated History Throughout history, many believers have said they believe in Jesus according to what Paul preached. In the past, these believers called themselves true believers, but others called them Paulicians. The Paulicians were continually persecuted by the Byzantine emperors. The Roman laws, peace, and roads helped further the gospel of God. The Roman Empire was divided in AD 395. The Western Roman Empire fell because of various invaders around AD 450. However, the Eastern Roman Empire continued for about another thousand years. The Koine Greek used to write the New Testament, the Textus Receptus, was preserved in that empire, possibly by the Pauline Christians. Greek is perhaps the most versatile language in the world. After the Ottoman Turks invaded and destroyed the Eastern Roman Empire and sacked Byzantium, Constantinople, in AD 1453, they persecuted the Paulicians. Many Paulicians lived in Bulgaria, Bogolomists. Many fled to the Italian Alps, while Densians and joined with the Paulicians there. Many moved to France, Cathars, and even as far as London. Many Christians who fled from the Ottoman Turks brought their Greek Bibles with them into Europe. Erasmus collected them and published the best ones. Tyndall, Luther, and others translated the Greek Textus Receptus published by Erasmus. Eventually, the King James Bible was translated and printed in 1611. Persecution of Paulicians There was a large group of Paulicians concentrated in Armenia at the base of Mount Ararat. The Turkish government systematically slaughtered, exterminated, and killed 1.5 million Armenians inside their own borders, genocide. See the picture from the 1915 genocide found on wikipedia.org. Some escaped. The Armenians are still alive all over the world and their country is in Georgia of Russia. In comparison, Hitler killed 6 million Jews and 5 million Christians. Throughout time some have believed what Paul preached, that God is forming a new group, the body of Christ, to live in heaven. Armenians can now be found all over the world, but are they still Pauline? That is the question. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister. Colossians 1 verse 23 God wants us all to understand the entire Bible from the point of view of what Paul wrote to us in the body of Christ in his 13 letters, Romans to Philemon. I have only shared a brief overview of their history. Pastor Brian Ross has an excellent in-depth series about the history of the Pauline believers called the Grace History Project, Grace Life Bible Church, available on the Internet. Paulicians were persecuted by the Byzantine emperors. Christian women captives being taken deep into Turkey. Satan constantly opposes God. Ever since Genesis 3 verse 15, when Satan heard that the seed of the woman would bruise his head, Satan had wanted to kill the seed before he could hurt him. Satan had been calculating the time the Redeemer would come to Israel according to Daniel's timeline and had gone ahead spreading disease, evil spirits, and false religious teaching, the tradition of men. When Jesus Christ arrived, there may have been more devils possessing people than people in Israel. God knew that Satan's plot was to kill Jesus. God had a plan that included the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 verse 1. God had also prepared the world for his son's arrival and the spreading of the gospel. Because of Alexander the Great's empire, the Greek language, which is perhaps the most versatile, was being spoken in most of the known world. Greek culture was also widespread. Next came the Roman Empire with law and order, peace, and great roads. Several helpful maps follow. Top Alexander the Great's empire was divided after his death. Below the fall of Western Roman Empire, see 450 AD. Top Roman Empire under Trajan slash below divided Roman Empire in 395 AD. Constantinople fell in 1453. The fall of Eastern Roman, Byzantine, Empire, by the Ottoman Turks. The above map of 1606 shows the empire of the Turks in pink. 
Massacre of Armenians by the Turks in 1915, 1.5 million of them, Wikipedia. For Roman districts on a helpful map, circa 300 AD. Notice Thessalonica and Armenia. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the model minister, Paul, and his reward. 2 colon 1 dash 6 faithful preacher with a pure motive. 2 colon 7 dash 10 cherished them with gentle love as a nursing mother would. 2 11 12 concerned for them like a father for his children. 2 13 receptive hearts result in genuine faith. 2 colon 14 dash 20 they are Paul's reward, his joy, and crown. The apostles had pure motives, 1 to 6, exemplary conduct with unselfish concern, 7 to 12, and shared the authentic true words of God, 2 13. The exemplary evangelism of the ministers resulted in the exemplary conversion of these new believers. They are Paul's reward, his joy, and his crown, 2 colon 14 20. There are no apostles today. Paul was a model to the body of Christ. No other individual teacher or preacher is a model apostle. Nevertheless, we should all live right. Review. In the last lesson, we learned that the Thessalonians were a model. Church. They turned to God from idols. The Thessalonians received the doctrine of the mystery that Paul and his co-workers delivered to them by the power of the Holy Ghost. They became followers of us and of the Lord. After receiving by faith, the word with power and joy of the Holy Ghost, they sounded it out and shared the truth everywhere. They were serving the true God and waiting for His Son, Jesus, which He raised, to come, who delivers us from having to go through the wrath, Matthew 3 verse 7, the tribulation. They were an exemplary model church, because they had an exemplary model minister. Paul will now use the way he ministered to them as a model for how they, and we, should minister to others. We are all to be ministers. The nation of Israel fell and is on hold, but Jews have hope in the body of Christ. The nation of Israel received a one-year extension of mercy to accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Empowered by the Holy Ghost, Peter, and the other followers of Christ's earthly ministry, preached a renewed offer of the kingdom, Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, 23 34. The nation of Israel rejected the offer. They fell in Acts 7 when the Jewish religious leaders denied the ministry of the Holy Ghost through Stephen, a member of the little flock. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Acts 7 verse 51. This was the unforgivable blasphemy of the Holy Ghost which the Lord Jesus warned the Israelites about, Matthew 12 verses 31 and 32. Paul refers to the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 16. God considers the nation of Israel as uncircumcised Gentiles and an apostasy. However, a Jew or Gentile can believe Paul's gospel and become a member of the body of Christ. There is no ethnic, racial, social, or gender distinctions in the body of Christ, Galatians 3 verse 28. The body of Christ is one new man. Ephesians 2 verse 15. Peter and his group continued preaching for another 17 years until the Jerusalem Council. In the future, God will make his nation out of that group. Paul went up to the Jerusalem Council of AD 52, Acts 15 verses 1 to 35. Galatians 1, 2, colon 1 10. So, Peter evangelized for 18 years after Christ ascended. Peter, James, and John agreed to let Paul preach to all unbelievers. Galatians 2, verses 6 to 9. This letter is probably written in AD 53. Although Paul began to preach the gospel of grace as soon as he was saved 17 years previously, for the past year it has been the only valid gospel. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1 verse 8. The Acts period is a time of transition from Christ's earthly ministry, through Peter, to Christ's heavenly ministry, through Paul. When the Father revealed to Peter that Jesus was the Christ, then Jesus knew that the Father wanted Peter to be the leader of the twelve, Matthew 16 verses 16 to 18. Paul says, even so then, at this present time also there is a remnant, Peter, and the little flock, 
Romans 11 verse 5. Peter knew he would one day be in charge of the twelve apostles as ordained by the Father, even if James temporarily took over the leadership of the little flock before the wrath. Matthew 19 verse 28. The Acts epistles are Romans, the Corinthian letters, Galatians, and the Thessalonian letters. We can use an analogy of God the Father as a farmer. The Father was growing potatoes in Peter's time, the four Gospels, and early Acts. When Paul was saved God began to grow beets also. For a while, God was growing both potatoes and beets. But since the little flock closed the door to new converts in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, he is only growing beets. Only Paul's gospel is valid today. Galatians 1 verses 6 to 9. Another analogy, a father had three sons. The first son grew potatoes. The second son potatoes and beets. The third son grew beets. If the father wants to grow beets now, which one is doing his will? Yes, that is right, the one who is growing beets. Likewise, if someone is not preaching and teaching Paul's gospel of the grace of God today, then they are not doing God's will. God is forming the body of Christ to live in heaven, not bringing in the kingdom on earth. What we do in life has everything to do with what our reward will be in heaven. In this chapter, Paul will show us how to minister so we can have rewards. 2 colon 1 for yourselves Brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Paul wants the Thessalonians to remember the brief but effective ministry he and his helpers had in Thessalonica before they were abruptly forced to abandon their work among them. He reminds them how the apostles served God when they entered in among them and preached. Their preaching to them was not in vain, useless, but brought results because many souls were saved. Paul wants them to follow his model ministry and preaching. He wants these new believers to notice how they ministered to them for their sake. What manner of men we were among you for your sake. 1 colon 5. Paul was a model to them and to us. Paul is our pattern. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. We are all to be ministers. 2 But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul said that they were bold in our God and continued to proclaim the gospel to them even after they had been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, Acts 16 verses 19 to 24. Likewise, they should not let their persecution keep them from loving others by preaching the truth. Paul and Silas didn't let the shameful way they were treated at Philippi slow them down in spreading the gospel. They were bold in our God to speak the gospel of God to them with much contention from the unbelieving Jews. Likewise, the Thessalonians should continue to be bold, 1 colon 6, although the unbelieving Jews argued against the truth of what Paul shared. Paul shared the gospel of God. The gospel of God occurs six times in Paul's writings and once in Peter's, 1 Peter 4 verse 17. It is the basic prophesied information that Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the Son of God, and the Son of David, was raised from the dead with power, Genesis 3 verse 15, Romans 1 verses 1 to 4. We should not think that because Peter and Paul both preached the gospel of God that they preached the same thing. Because by one cross, Christ saved two groups, those who will live in heaven and those who will live on earth. We can think of the gospel of God as a pie shell that can have either cherry or apple filling. Peter put the cherry filling in it, which was the gospel of the kingdom. Paul put the apple filling in it, which is the gospel of Christ. This information was taken from the gospel project written and presented by Pastor Brian Ross of Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids and by Pastor David Reed from Columbus Bible Church in Columbus, Ohio in October of 2013. Paul preached that Christ died for our sins, the sins of Jews and Gentiles living in mystery, and was raised for our justification, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, Romans 4 verses 24 and 25. Jesus Christ also died for the sins of Jews and Gentiles living in prophecy, Matthew 1 verse 21, Romans 5 verses 8 and 9. There are many gospels in the Bible, Noah, for example had to show his faith by building an ark. 
Everyone must believe the gospel God gave to them in their dispensation in order to be forgiven and have eternal life. 3. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, exhortation is urging or encouraging. Their counsel was not deceitful, nor of unclean, nor in guile, cunning, craftiness, or fraud. They spoke the pure true words Christ revealed to Paul, Galatians 1 verses 1 and 11, 12. They did not corrupt the word of God which Christ gave them to preach, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. Paul gave out the word of God exactly how he received it from Christ. He did not alter the word of God in any way. For but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Paul and his co-workers were allowed of God to preach the gospel Christ had entrusted to Paul. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, God put the gospel in their trust to guard, keep, and proclaim it. They spoke with the goal of pleasing God, not men. Because God tests our hearts and knows our motives, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Hebrews 4 verse 12. A faithful steward's motive is to live to please God, not men, Hebrews 11 verse 6. Our goal is to please God rather than men. 5 For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, 6 Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome, as the apostles of Christ. They know that Paul and his co-workers did not use flattering words at any time, their motives were pure, Proverbs 26 verse 28, Psalm 78 verse 36. They spoke the truth of Christ plainly. The strange woman in Proverbs represents false doctrine which flatters, Proverbs 6 verse 24. Antichrist will deceive many leaders in Israel with flattery, but not the Bible believers, Daniel 11 verses 21 and 32. The name Antichrist occurs four times in the King James Bible, three times in 1 John and once in 2 John. God is the witness that Paul did not have a hidden ulterior dishonest motive of taking anything from them. They did not seek fame, prestige, honor, praise, or monetary reward for themselves. Notice that Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus 1, 1 were apostles of Christ to the body of Christ. Paul was the main, primary, apostle, Romans 11 verse 13, and the other secondary Holy Ghost sent apostles. Acts 14 verse 14, of the mystery to the body of Christ. Paul was inspired and sent by Christ to be his spokesman and apostle to the body of Christ. Although, as apostles of Christ, they were entitled to payment, they did everything for free without asking for a penny. They supported themselves and gave out the word of God. Paul was the last apostle. 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, they were gentle among them as a nursing mother that cherishes her children. They fed them a little milk of the word here, and a little milk there, and carried them along. 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. They didn't want money or material things to stand in the way of them and the truth, because they desired for their souls to be saved. They were as a mother who has affection for her children and desires the best for them as she sacrificially gives of herself to her dear ones. With great affection and desire for them to understand the truth, the apostles were willing not only to share the gospel of God, but all the knowledge that was in their own souls because they were so dear to them. Others should be so precious to us that, as we are allowed of God, we should share the gospel and any illumination that the Holy Spirit has revealed to us through his word. 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. They labored as women in childbirth for Christ to be formed in them, Acts 20 verses 33 to 35. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4 verse 19. 
A man's work is from son to son, but a mother's work is never done. A mother does not receive a formal paycheck. A mother is often an example of sacrificial love. God's love is unparalleled, but a mother's love is also strong and dignified. Paul asks them to remember how he and his friends worked night and day to provide for themselves and preach the gospel of God to them. Paul didn't want any money from any of them. But Paul received monetary help from Philippi twice at that time because God put it on their hearts to give to him. Philippians 4 verses 15 and 16. Ten ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, they were witnesses, and so was God, how holy, justly, and without blame they had behaved themselves among them that believe. This is how Paul wants them, and us, to conduct ourselves, among others. We are to live worthy. 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children. 12. That ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Like a father, they urged them to believe and to live right. A father must watch over his family and make sacrifices as he provides for their welfare. A father is a role model for his children. A loving father encourages, comforts, commands, instructs, guides, and directs his children to be responsible to do their duty. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 4 Paul was approachable and gave personal encouragement, attention, and counsel to each one individually. This is how Paul was and how he expects them and us to be toward others. As their spiritual father, Paul wants them to walk worthy of God, who has called them, by the Gospel 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 13 and 14, into his kingdom, made up of two groups those who live in heaven and those who live on earth, and glory, to eternally glorify his Son. They are to walk worthy and be holy, just, and unblameable, 2.10, like the Apostle, while serving God, who has called them into his heavenly kingdom, 2 Timothy 4 verse 18. 13 For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Whenever Paul writes, for this cause, we need to know what the cause was, in this case it is to walk worthy of God, 2.12, since they have been called into his kingdom and glory. What is the key to their success in such a short time? They had the right response to the word of God. They trusted exclusively what Christ said to through Paul. This local assembly of believers was a model church because of how they received the word of God given to Paul for them. They were a young church, but full of faith. They put their faith in the word Christ gave to Paul because it was in truth the word of God, not the word of men. The word of God saved them and made them want to serve God. Paul is thrilled and thankful to God continuously because when they received the word of God, which works effectually in those who believe, the Thessalonians knew that Paul spoke Christ's words to them. Notice that they heard the words, they were not written down. Paul did not write any inspired scripture until after the Jerusalem Council, AD 52. He wrote Galatians, Acts 15 verse 35, and then the Thessalonian letters, Acts 18 verse 5 and 18 11. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to work effectually in us who believe it. How did Paul know the Word of God would work effectually in them? Because it did in him. First, we must be saved by believing the Gospel, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Second, we must believe that God has preserved His Word, Psalm 12 verses 6 and 7. In English, we have His Word is in the King James Bible. God has preserved his word in other languages, too. Third, we must apply 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 and divide the truth of the mystery, Romans to Philemon, from the truth of prophecy, the rest of the Bible. Then as we read and understand the word of God by his spirit in us and believe it, we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. Thinking precedes actions. When we think like Christ in heaven would, then we act in the way we should. This is how the word of God works in us. Christ's spirit in us, Colossians 1 verse 27, functions by using his word. When we know him, Philippians 3 verse 8, his will, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, 
which part of the Bible is to us, Paul's writings, and who we are in him, Romans 8 verse 17, Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10, then we can be his effective sons and daughters, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 18. Jesus Christ can live his life through us as we present our bodies a living sacrifice, Galatians 2 verse 20, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. 14 For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. They followed the little flock, Luke 12 verse 32, churches of the circumcision in Judea in suffering, not in doctrine. There are three churches mentioned in the Bible, Matthew 16 verse 18, Acts 7 verse 38, Ephesians 1 22, 23. The Thessalonians were suffering because of the unbelieving idolaters and Jews who were their countrymen. The kingdom on earth churches in Judea in Christ Jesus suffered at the hands of the unbelieving Jews. All believers on this side of the cross are in Christ, John 17 verse 21, Romans 16 verse 7. Those of the circumcision, Peter and his group, were also in Christ by faith. There is no salvation outside of being in Christ on this side of the cross, because if a person is not in Christ, then they are in Adam. They believe that Christ who came at his first advent is their Messiah to sit on the throne of David in the kingdom on earth. They had no understanding of the good news of the cross before or after Christ's death. Luke 18 verses 31 to 34, Acts 2 verse 23. Paul calls them the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, because the apostate unbelieving Jews were persecuting them, but God will make his nation of Israel over using the believing remnant, Matthew 19 verse 28, 21 43. The true Israel, the believing remnant, the no people, a foolish nation, are of the same lump, Israel. Paul said God will make his nation out of the remnant and the rest were blinded, Romans 9 verses 6 and 21, 10 19, 11 colon 5 7, 25. Paul had been one of their persecutors before he was saved in Acts 9, Acts 8 verse 1. Paul's first apostolic miracle was to temporarily blind the unbelieving Jewish sorcerer Elimas, a type of Israel, who withstood his preaching to a Gentile, Acts 13 verses 6 to 13. Israel did not realize that Christ had to suffer as the sacrificial lamb of God and shed his blood for their sins before he came as their king. They are sons of both Abraham and Adam. By one cross, Christ died for Jews and Gentiles in both groups, the heavenly believers, in mystery, and the earthly believers, in prophecy. Fifteen who both killed the Lord Jesus, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God and are contrary to all men. Sixteen forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. The wrath of God has come upon their own unbelieving countrymen who persecuted the Thessalonians, as it has on the unbelieving Jews that persecuted Peter's group in Jerusalem, to the uttermost. The nation of Israel's leaders committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost when they stoned Stephen in Acts 7 verses 51 to 60. The wrath of God is come upon the Jewish persecutors to the uttermost in that they will suffer eternal damnation, the second death. Unbelievers will not be forgiven as the Lord said. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Matthew 12 verses 31 and 32. Israel first rejected the Father, then Christ, and then the Holy Ghost. They ran out of the Godhead. The Holy Ghost is the last person of the Godhead, so no other prospects existed. When Christ was crucified, he pleaded, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, Luke 23 verse 34. This fulfilled Christ's words, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Israel was forgiven of killing the Lord Jesus in ignorance and given another bonus year to turn to God and believe that he was their Messiah.
But, when the Holy Ghost was poured out on Pentecost, Israel continued to reject the Holy Ghost-filled disciples of Christ's earthly ministry, culminating in the stoning of Stephen. This resulted in Israel being set aside and God ushering in a new dispensation revealed through Paul. The same Jews that the Thessalonians are dealing with had persecuted Paul and his helpers. What those Jews are doing is not pleasing to God, they are against all men, the kingdom on earth believers, and Paul's group. They try to prevent the Gentiles from hearing the gospel preached to them by Paul, so that they can be saved. They are adding to their sins, always filling up their sins, because they would not believe God, be saved, and join the body of Christ. They have no hope of an earthly kingdom at this time because it has been postponed and interrupted. God has inserted the dispensation of grace, a period of amnesty when God is offering salvation to all people. Those who believe the gospel of Christ that Paul preached will be saved, forgiven, join the body of Christ, and live in heaven. For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you ward, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 9. Hidden God. The dispensation of grace was in God's mind all along, although God did not tell anyone about it until Paul. Paul's ministry, which has a heavenly hope, is in effect now. 17 But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. But Paul was taken from the presence of the Thessalonians for a short time. They are briefly physically separated, but not in heart. Paul and company had a great desire to see their faces. 18 Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul tried to come to them twice, once and again, but Satan hindered them. He probably ran into some Jews blocking his travel plans and way. Those Jews were empowered by the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, which is the Spirit of the Prince of the Power of the Air, Satan, Ephesians 2 verse 2. Satan also works in unsaved Gentiles. In fact, the purpose of the course of this world, Ephesians 2 verse 2, is to keep people from knowing God. Paul did see the Thessalonians again several times a few years later. 19. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? 20. For ye are our glory and joy. Having let them know how greatly he longs to see them, Paul asks from the heart, What is our hope, joy, crown of rejoicing? They are his crown, reward. Paul speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in relation to the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, these believers will be his reward, glory, and joy. Paul lovingly answers that they are all these things, ye are our glory and joy. More believing members added to the body of Christ is his reward. More reward means more responsibility at the judgment seat of Christ. This is what God's will is. Who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. What God is doing today is building the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace to live in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, 3, 2, 6. We learn by imitation. Often it is not so much what is taught that changes our lives, but what is caught. Paul's life was a sermon. He did not want to make a name for himself, but to proclaim and glorify him who saved his soul from hell and gave him eternal life. He always gave God all the glory. 
He came to give them the gospel and to build them up in their faith. Paul wants them to remember what he did among them so they can do the same. They did a work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope because Paul did. Since it was Christ doing the work in and through Paul, and in us and through us, Christ will have all the glory for what was accomplished. Christ gave Paul the privilege to be put in trust with the gospel, 1 Timothy 1 verse 11. Paul committed the gospel to Timothy and expected him to commit it to faithful men, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. Stewards of the mysteries are to be faithful, 1 Corinthians 4 verses 1 to 2. Part of the work of the church is to make sure that accurate copies are made of God's word, 1 Timothy 3 15, 5 17. The central theme of the Bible is knowing God, to understand his wisdom in what says and does. Christ, in his earthly ministry, said that whoever has spiritual ears to understand his word will receive more, Luke 8 verse 18. It is on the basis of the quality of our work that we will be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ, too. Corinthians 5 10. We show God, we love him by reading and studying his word. This is the end of part two. Part three. One year extension of mercy for Israel. Although the prophetic clock, according to Daniel's timeline, stopped on Palm Sunday, Israel received a bonus year of mercy from God. In addition to asking the Father to forgive them because of their ignorance while on the cross, Jesus had also pleaded with the Father to give his people one more year to repent and receive him as their Messiah. A certain man, God the Father, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit, faith, thereon, and found none. Then said he, God the Father, unto the dresser of his vineyard, God the Son, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, Israel, and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he, the Son, answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, give Israel one more year, till I shall dig about it, and dung, fertilized by the power of the Holy Spirit, it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down, cut off Israel for a season. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. But Peter and the disciples of Christ, the little remnant, the little flock, did have faith in him, so the kingdom was taken from the unbelieving nation of Israel and given to the remnant of believing Israel. Therefore, say I, Jesus, unto you, the religious leaders of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, the little flock, bringing forth the fruits, faith, thereof. Matthew 21 verse 43. The little flock, believing remnant, received the kingdom, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke. 1232. When Peter asked Jesus what he would receive for his faithfulness Jesus, answered, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the earth is regenerated in the millennium, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye, the twelve apostles, also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, Matthew 19 verse 28. Three times a year Israel was to keep a feast to the Lord. These feasts are a picture of God's plan to redeem them. Christ has already fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, held in Abib, the first month. The next, Pentecost, 50 days later, was fulfilled in Acts 2. The Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles, in the seventh month, will be fulfilled when Israel is gathered into their land, the nation is forgiven, and Messiah rules and lives with them. The final feasts, as we will learn, have been postponed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 A Model Brother, Timothy 3 colon 1 dash 5 Why Paul sent Timothy 3 colon 6 dash 8 Timothy's good report 3 colon 9 dash 13 Paul's prayer for them The Thessalonians were a model church because they had a model minister In this chapter we will learn about the model brother but most of all we will learn that believers are to be a channel or vessel of blessing to others We are to let Christ live through us but unless we understand the Bible by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, we will not be useful sons and daughters of God or channels of blessing. 
We will also look at the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. This is why it is really important to understand the mystery. In order to know, 1. The gospel that saves us, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. 2. Who our apostle is, Paul, Romans 11 verse 13. 3. When the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace began, Acts 9, 4, which scriptures are to and about us, Romans to Philemon, 5, that the rest of the Bible is for our learning, Romans 15 verse 4, 6, the sound doctrine to the church, the body of Christ, and 7, how to serve God in accordance to that doctrine. When I was a mixer, mixing Peter and Paul, I had little, if any, fruit. In the past, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6, and in the future, ISA 61, 6-8, God will use the nation of Israel as a channel of blessing to the world. Today, each individual member of the body of Christ is to be a channel of blessing to the world. Sometimes we can get a clog or kink in being a channel of blessing. The sinful flesh is very self-centered. Today we will learn how to unclog and unkink so we can be channels of blessing. The good thing about Satan's hindrance was that it forced Apostle Paul to write this letter. It edifies and builds us up in our understanding and faith. These inspired words of Christ from heaven have blessed people for nearly 2,000 years. The phrase your faith appears five times in this chapter, 3 colon 2, 3 colon 5, 3 colon 6, 3 colon 7, 3 10. Paul was clearly concerned about their faith and wanted them to stand strong in it. Each of the chapters in 1 Thessalonians ends with a reference to the rapture. In this chapter, it is in relation to Christ's presentation of the body of Christ to the Father. The rapture was a mystery, behold, I shew you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, which was not revealed anywhere in the Bible until God revealed it to Paul. Notice that whenever Paul writes about the rapture, he doesn't quote Old Testament scripture because the rapture was not prophesied but new revelation given by the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ to him. The day of Christ encompasses three events, one, the rapture, two, the judgment seat of Christ, and three, Christ's presentation of the body of Christ to the Father. Three, colon one, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, too, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith. By your faith Paul means is your faith in the faith we preach, Christ's doctrine through Paul. Paul uses the phrase the faith 30 times in his other letters. It is interesting how he uses the phrase in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. When Paul could no longer endure the suspense of how the Thessalonians were doing, the apostles came up with a plan to go around Satan's hindrance of Paul himself seeing the new saints. Paul sent Timotheus, a model brother, a minister of God, and their fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish and comfort them concerning their faith. Meanwhile, Paul stayed in Athens alone. Paul knew he could trust Timothy to remind them of the doctrine Christ had given him. Timothy would reinforce what Paul had taught them so far. Timothy would be a channel of blessing to them. Timothy was saved on Paul's first apostolic journey, Acts 14 verses 6 and 7. Timothy was well reported of the brethren that were at Lystra, Acts 16 verses 1 to 3. Paul picked Timothy to minister with him. Paul gave his estimation of Timothy in his letter to the Philippians. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him, that, as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Philippians 2 verses 19-24 Timothy and Silas willingly traveled 200 miles there and the same distance back to help the Thessalonians. God is working in us, Ephesians 2 verse 10, to make us willing servants, channels of blessings. We are to be mature adult sons and daughters who serve God. Willingly, doing what pleases Him. The phrase your faith appears five times in this chapter, 
3 colon 2, 3 colon 5, 3 colon 6, 3 colon 7, 3 10. Paul was clearly concerned about their faith and wanted them to stand strong in it. How did Paul establish them in the faith? He sent them a brother, 3 colon 1, 2. He wrote them a letter, 3 colon 3, 4. He prayed for them, 3 colon 5 dash 10 and he reminded them of Christ's return, 3 colon 11 13. Once we are saved, we can do the same for them, as channels or vessels of blessing of his love. I am blessed that several of my friends have understood the mystery, but many more have been hard-hearted and unteachable. 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Paul had taught them the doctrine of suffering. Satan is against all who are in Christ. Satan wants to move believers away from Paul's sound doctrine. All believers are appointed to afflictions, but the body of Christ is not appointed to wrath. 5 9. Paul had personally suffered at the hands of many of those evil men who were now persecuting the Thessalonians. Their persecution and affliction should not move them away from Pauline truth. True believers are appointed thereunto. 3 3. The Galatians had been moved away from the faith that Paul had delivered to them. Paul told the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him, Christ through Paul, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Galatians 1 verses 6 and 7. The Galatians had been seduced into believing that although they were saved by faith, they must keep the law in order to live the Christian life. But we are saved by faith and should live the same way, by faith. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 We walk the same way as we were saved, by faith. We live by believing the doctrine that Christ revealed to Paul as recorded in Romans to Philemon. We believe from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, Romans 6 verse 17. Christ's doctrine to us through Paul will work in us when we understand it. When we follow Paul's doctrine, we are not under the law. The law makes the dead sinful flesh in us come alive again. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Romans 7 verse 13. The sinful flesh can clog or kink us up so the spirit of Jesus can't flow through us. Man is naturally self-centered. Paul said, Sin dwelleth in me, Romans 7 verses 17 and 18. How do we unclog and unkink so we can be a channel of blessing? Although we are dead to sin, Romans 6 verse 2, and dead to the law, Romans 7 verse 4, our sinful flesh, which is in our mortal bodies, will only stay dead if we walk in the Spirit, Romans 8 verse 14, Galatians 5 verses 16 to 18. Paul discovered that there was a law, a fact, reality, or constant rule, that evil is present with me, Romans 7 verse 21. Not a law like the law of Moses, but a law as in the law of gravity. Paul called it the body of the sins of the flesh, Colossians 2 verse 11. There is a way to be free of this law, reality, and fact and that is to walk in the Spirit by faith. When we understand our identity in Christ, we can function correctly. We were baptized into his death, Romans 6 verses 3 and 4, and raised in newness of life, and alive unto God, Romans 6 verse 11. We can have Christ's life flowing through us, his words are spiritual life. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. Here is the crux, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, our flesh was too weak to keep the law. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, Romans 8 verse 3. But Christ succeeded, he was able to keep the law perfectly. Christ condemned our sin nature on the cross. Sins are the wrong things we do. Sin is our sin nature. Christ was made sin for us, destroying or crucifying our sin nature in his flesh on the cross, so that we could have his righteousness imputed to us, 
2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Christ went through with the cross, not because he needed to, but because we needed him to. Romans is about the righteousness of God, and how God can justify a sinner and make him acceptable and righteous while he continues to sin. Do we continue to sin after salvation? Yes, if people think they are going to be sinless after salvation, they can get discouraged. But we can be sinless if we walk in the Spirit. Christ came through the sacrificial system apart from the law, Romans 3 verses 21 and 22. This is how God solved our sin problem. Every person has sinned. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Eccle. 720. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23. But we are justified freely by the faith of Christ if we believe the good news that God has said we need to believe. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. After the cross, the Father declared the Old Testament, those saints that died before the cross, righteous because of Christ's sacrifice, Romans 3 verses 24 and 25. The Father can remain just and justify believers in mystery because at salvation the righteousness of Christ was imputed to us, Romans 3 26, 4, 5, 23 to 25, 5, 10, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. The Father loves His Son, and we are in Him. We become sons of God by having the Spirit of His Son in us. Now with Christ's life working in and through us, we can be effective sons of God. Once we understand the mystery, we are not to be moved from that truth. When I was a mixer, mixing Peter and Paul the first had little, if any, fruit. Paul was not moved from preaching and teaching the truth Christ gave him. Paul stayed the course, he stood fast until he was martyred. He told the Ephesian elders that he wanted to reach his kinsmen. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 verse 24. At the end of his life Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing, 2 Timothy 4 verses 7 and 8. In this case, I believe his appearing refers to Christ's appearing to Paul on the road to Damascus. Christ's next glorious appearing will be at the rapture. Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, Titus 2 verse 13. The body of Christ and the dispensation of grace began when Christ appeared to Paul and will end when Christ appears in the air to catch us up. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 6 verse 14. Christ's two appearings are like two bookends with the mystery of the body of Christ being formed in the dispensation of grace in between the two appearings. The adversary will try to move believers from the faith. Therefore, until the rapture we are to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Dot. For for verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Paul had told them when he was with them to expect trouble, suffering, and persecution, which had now come to pass. He had told them that they would suffer tribulation, but not the tribulation. Paul and the Thessalonians had both suffered afflictions from the unbelievers. They, and we, are living in the present evil world, Galatians 1 verse 4, surrounded by godless men and women. Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Jesus told Ananias, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, Acts 9 verse 16. In Lystra, Paul had healed a man lame in his feet from his mother's womb, and this miracle caused the idol-worshipping Gentiles to want to worship Paul and Barnabas. But when the unbelieving Jews came from Antioch of Pisidia and Iconium, they convinced these same people, who wanted to worship them in one moment, to want to stone Paul in the next moment. But God was not finished with Paul and God revived him from death, Acts 14 verses 19 to 22. 
5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Paul wanted to know your faith if they were following Paul's doctrine. When Paul could no longer stand the suspense of how their faith was holding up in the face of strong persecution, Paul got around the tempters, Satan, hindrance of him by sending brother Timothy and Silas, Acts 18 verse 5, to find out if the tempter had tempted them away from the truth with his lies, so that all their labor to minister to them would be useless. 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you, Timothy brought good tidings or glad tidings or good news. They had not been tempted to depart from the truth, so they could avoid persecution. Their faith and love had endured the temptations. Their steadfastness and tender regard for the apostle prompted Paul to write this touching and intimate letter in which he praises them for standing firm in the faith. His heart was overflowing with love and joy and pride for how the Thessalonians received the word of God and were holding up under persecution. Paul's heart was warmed and comforted when he heard that the Thessalonians wanted to see him again. He longed to see them, too. It was a young church, but they believed that Christ was speaking to them through Paul. In effect they told Timothy, Please tell Paul that as soon as he can to please return and teach us again, for we are hungry for more. They were doing fantastic in what they had taught them. But Paul wants to teach them more, since his ministry to them was cut short. They were not deserting or departing from Paul. This was not the response Paul had from the Corinthians or the Galatians. He told the Corinthians, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 15. He said to the Galatians, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain, Galatians 4 verse 11. The Thessalonians proved their faith by their charity toward others. Love is caring about others, while charity is Christ's love in us and through us, among other believers. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Colossians 3 verse 14. Charity is selfless sacrificial benevolence toward others. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, Christ through Paul loved them. A pure, genuine, true Pauline understanding of the Bible will naturally produce charity and other fruit of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. Charity leads us to value, esteem, other members in the body of Christ. 7 Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith, The apostles were comforted that despite their afflictions, they still believed the doctrine they taught them. The apostles' afflictions were worth it, and they didn't have to be distressed about their faith, because it was still going strong. Their worry was alleviated, because the Thessalonians were enduring their afflictions. God wants obedience without compromise. We are not to follow the path of least resistance, that is a worldly idea from the devil. We are to stand for the truth even in the midst of persecution. Jesus did not take the easy way out. Paul suffered greatly to give us the gospel. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Colossians 1 verse 24. Paul rejoiced in his sufferings because he was happy to serve Christ for the sake of his people. In Thessalonica, Paul had been smuggled out of Jason's house and brought to Berea. Later on in Ephesus, he had to leave town because the mob wanted to tear him apart in their uproar instigated by the silver and copper idol makers. The ministry Paul had built over three years in Ephesus came to an abrupt end. We are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2 verse 3, not to take the easy way out. 8. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Paul said in effect, it would kill us if you didn't stand fast in your faith. But now we can live if you stand fast in the Lord. It gave Paul a surge of life, a giant shot in the arm, to hear that the young church was standing firm in the faith he delivered unto them in the middle of persecution. 
When we know who we are in Christ, that we are complete in Him, Colossians 2 verse 10, then we can stand fast in the Lord. We are to have faith in what Christ preached to the body of Christ through Paul, not what Christ preached in his earthly ministry to Israel as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans 15 verse 8. In the past, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6, and in the future, ISA 61, 6-8, God will use the nation of Israel as a channel of blessing to the world. The believing remnant of Israel will be a channel of blessing, good news, and a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, Zechariah 8 verse 13. The believing remnant will live in dependence of Christ. Today, each individual member of the body of Christ is to be a channel of blessing to the world. Dot. 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, ten night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. 11. Now God himself and our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way unto you. They were so relieved and overjoyed with gratitude to God for how well these believers were doing in the faith. They prayed and thanked God so many times for them they didn't know what else they could thank God for. We talked to God about his people, then we talked to his people about God. They prayed night and day. Paul had taught them many things and may have had to leave them abruptly without having time to finish teaching them all that he wanted them to know. Paul wanted to share more of the progressive revelation he was constantly receiving from the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the mystery. Paul wants to perfect that which is lacking in your faith, 310. Paul longed to return and teach them more. The apostles were praying exceedingly that the God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ would guide them back to them. 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Although their standing is perfect before God, Paul wants their state to match their standing. Their practice is to line up with their position in Christ. He prays that the Lord would make them to increase and abound in love one toward another and to all men, even as Paul and his co-workers have loved them. They, and we, are to be channels or conduits of Christ's love to all men, just as the apostles were to the Thessalonians. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13 verses 9 and 10. Love seeks the highest good for another, their greatest welfare. Paul has been encouraging them to have faith, love, and hope the hallmarks of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 13. 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Establish means to start building something solid, while establish means to make what has been established stable. If they follow Christ's doctrine to them through Paul, then they will be able to be stable, unblameable, and holy at his coming. 2.10. When we understand the mystery by rightly dividing the word of truth, then the doctrine will work in us to produce something of value at the judgment seat of Christ. And, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister. Colossians 1 verses 21 to 23. We are still saved if we have believed the gospel, but our service will be shipwreck or castaway. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27. If we do not continue in Paul's doctrine, the Lord Jesus Christ will bring the body of Christ before God the Father and will present there, and our hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day of Christ includes three events, 1. The rapture, 2. The judgment seat of Christ, JSC, and 3. Then Christ's presentation of the body of Christ to the Father. 
This verse is talking about Christ presenting us to the Father. It is also true that them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14 When the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, at the rapture. The judgment seat of Christ for service, Romans 14 verse 10, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 10 to 16, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, is after the rapture. This life is the only opportunity we have that is going to count for a reward there. Any blemishes or false doctrine will be burned off of the believers there, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 to 15. The fire of the eyes of Jesus Christ and the fire of the Word of God, Je. 2329, Revelation 1 verse 14, will burn off the wood, hay, and stubble, false doctrine and work done with false motives. After we are purified, then Christ will present the glorious church to the Father, 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13, Colossians 1 verse 22. It will be holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5 verse 27. Upon salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit. It is the life of Jesus in us, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 and 10, 11, Galatians 2 verse 20. His life in us helps us to be sanctified as we nourish our inner man with sound doctrine. The Holy Spirit in us needs to be fed the Word of God rightly divided. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. We can pray for God to increase our faith, but it isn't going to happen unless we increase our time studying and understanding God's Word. There is no substitute for a consistent prayer life and study of God's Word. We counter false doctrine with true doctrine. This is how Satan's power is defeated and believers become stable. A believer who is ignorant of the Bible rightly divided is prey to every wind of doctrine and will not be established in the Lord. Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 16. A mind void of God's words will be filled with Satan's lies. Not only do we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice for Christ to live through, but we need to renew, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, or reprogram our minds daily with God's word. God is not working physically in our lives, but spiritually. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2 verse 13. The Holy Spirit keeps us and continues his work in us until the day of Christ, Philippians 1 10 to 16. We will rejoice in heaven on that day. Paul will tell believers at the end of this letter that he wants the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 523. If we walk in the Spirit, then we will be blameless and useful channels of blessings with Christ living in and through us to others. I believe at the JSOC many of us will be sad that we did not do more for God that we were not as rich in rewards or in our financial support of God's work as we could have been. We are to do His will, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, share Paul's gospel, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 9. What is the mystery of godliness? Godliness is God living His life through the believer. And without controversy great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ is manifest in the believer, justified in the spirit, the life and righteousness of Jesus in the believer justifies the believer, seen of angels, the angels are watching us, Ephesians 3 verse 10, preached unto the Gentiles, Jesus was preached to the Gentiles in the mystery, believed on in the world. In the world those who believe 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 are saved, received up into glory, at the rapture the body of Christ will be received up into glory. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. Jesus died for us, so he could give his life to us, so he could live his life through us. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He is our hope. How can we be unblameable in holiness before God? We have his imputed righteousness, his spirit, and his word specifically to us, and all the Bible. The great war, our dead flesh still in our mortal body is still self-centered. 
But the Word of God will do the work of God by His Spirit in us as we understand and believe His words to us through His and our Apostle Paul. What the Old Testament Prophets Saw 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 A model walk and the rapture 4 colon 1-8 walk in holiness 4 colon 9 10 walk in love 4 11 12 walk in honesty 4 colon 13-18 walk in hope The Old Testament prophets could see events associated with the first and second coming of Christ, his sufferings, and his glory, 1 Peter 1 verses 10 and 11. But the prophets did not know anything about the church, the body of Christ. Christ's sudden return a year or so after the cross to save Saul of Tarsus was unprophesied and Christ's sudden return to rapture the church is unprophesied. In fact, the entire dispensation of the grace of God, when God is forming the body of Christ to live in heaven was a mystery that has lasted for nearly 2,000 years, was unprophesied. The certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture becomes obvious when we understand the difference between prophecy and mystery. We need to know both, all the counsel of God. The key is to know that the body of Christ began in Acts 9 with Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus, not in Acts 2. The opportunity to live forever as a member of the body of Christ ends with the rapture. Anyone who has believed the good news that Paul preached will be going up, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. The word rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate Bible word for caught up which is repimer. The Greek word for caught up is harpozo. Chapters 1 to 3 are more doctrinal, while chapters 4 and 5 are practical application concerning the believer's walk. Paul disclosed to the Thessalonians the three main tenets of our faith. Justification equals salvation, having Christ's imputed righteousness and eternal life. Sanctification equals spiritual growth resulting in reward at Christ's judgment seat. Glorification equals our new bodies at the rapture. Completely sinless eternal. State. In this chapter, Paul focuses on their sanctification, walk, and their glorification. For colon one furthermore then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Grace beseeches, begs, or implore, and it does not command. They exhort or urge them by the Lord Jesus how they are to walk, both by word and by example. 2.10. Paul had not only told them to walk worthy of God. 2.12. But the apostles had also demonstrated, modeled, how they should walk. 2 colon 4, 10, 3, 12. Paul has just said that the Lord will stabilize their hearts unblameable in holiness before God in heaven. By the apostles' example they've received of us how you ought to walk by following our gospel. 1 colon 5, 3, 13, 4 colon 1, Paul's doctrine. Their walk to please. God should keep going and growing abound more and more. The Lord wants our walk, life, or conduct to please God and continue to be copious or overflowing. 2. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. These commandments were by the Lord Jesus, not by men. The will of God, even your sanctification, to grow and mature in the faith and to abstain from fornication. Fornication is twofold, both spiritual and physical. They are to be pure doctrinally, spiritually, and physically. They are to abstain from spiritual idolatry, the idol worship they came out of, 1 colon 9, and the pagan immorality that they had been delivered from, which was then occurring around them. Idolatry and immorality have been prevalent throughout the ages, and it still is today. The sanctity of marriage is upheld by abstaining from fornication. Another reason Paul warned the Thessalonians to abstain from fornication was that James had asked him to. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem, Acts 15 verses 20 to 29, 16 colon 4, 21 25, dot. For that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, Sanctification means to be set apart for a purpose. 
Each individual is responsible to know how to possess his or her vessel so that it is set apart for the purpose of serving God and is used in a way that is honorable. We are to be conduits of the Lord's love. 3 12, 13. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 verse 16. How do we walk in the Spirit? We walk in the Spirit when we allow the sound doctrine God gave us through Paul to work effectually in us. 2 13. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus 1 verse 9. We are to depart from false doctrine, which is iniquity. 2 Timothy 2 verses 19 and 20. Dot. 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. 6. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Paul had warned them that the Lord is the avenger of all such as defraud their brother. The Jews had forbidden Paul to speak to the Gentiles so they might be saved. 2.16. The Thessalonians were surrounded by unbelievers that practiced concupiscence or sensual, sexual, lustful behaviors. Believers are to lead a life of personal holiness. We call what we do when no one but God is watching, character. Our bodies are the temple of Christ, and we should not defile it by sex outside of marriage, because then we sin against ourselves and God. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 15 to 19. They are not to lust for idols or practice sensual sexual lust like the lost Gentiles who know not God. Paul kept his body under subjection to his will. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 26 and 27. No one should defraud someone else in any matter, their faith, or by stealing their husband or wife. Because the Lord is the avenger of such and will hold everyone accountable for their own actions. God told Israel, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live, turn ye, Turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33 verse 11 Likewise, God has no delight in the death of the wicked in mystery. Paul warned them that God's wrath would come upon them, unbelieving Jews and Gentiles, who hinder God's word from going forth so others can be saved. 2.16 The apostles warned them ahead of time saying that God has not called them to spiritual or physical uncleanness, but to walk in holiness. Christ is holy. Our goal is to be like Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16 verse 25, but we will never be Christ, Ephesians 4 verses 13 and 16, 21 to 24, 32. 8. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Therefore, whoever despises to obey the Lord's commandments, for, colon 3, Apostle Paul gave them for how to live a holy life, despises not man, but God. By an unworthy walk, wrong behavior, they despise God. Paul has mentioned the Holy Ghost, 1, colon 5, 6, twice, and now the Holy Spirit, once. They, and we, received the Holy Spirit to help and teach us how to live holy lives. The word spirit does not always refer to the Holy Ghost. Jesus, who was the only person of the Godhead to put on human flesh, said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4 verse 24. The Holy Father is spirit, the Son is spirit, and the Holy Ghost is spirit. When the King James Bible says the Holy Ghost, it is referring specifically to the Holy Ghost, but when the Bible says spirit, then it could be referring to any one of the three persons of the Godhead, and the context must help us decide which one. We find that the spirit in the Bible is often the spirit of Jesus Christ in the believer, Romans 8 verse 2. Therefore, sometimes the spirit in us is Christ's, sometimes the Holy Ghost's, and sometimes the Father's, because all three live in us. We become sons of God by having the spirit of his Son in us. It is the work of God's Holy Spirit that they are hindering. 9. But as touching brotherly love ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. 
10 And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. The Thessalonians were already demonstrating brotherly love, charity, among themselves and to others, so Paul had no need to write to them about that. They, and we, are taught of God to love one another. Their labor of love was evident to all in Macedonia. Paul beseeches them to increase their work of charity more and more. What is the most loving thing we can do for someone? Yes, that is right, to share the gospel with others, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. God's word has the power to save souls and to help people to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is God's will that all men be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. We live holy lives when we let the doctrine make us conduits of God's love and good news to the lost. We willingly present our bodies so the Spirit of Christ can do the work in and through us. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, Colossians 1 verse 27. Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2 verse 20. 11 And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. 12 That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Why does Paul say, study to be quiet? One way to possess our vessels in sanctification and honor is to learn to tame our tongue. Paul is not saying don't share the gospel. We are to mind our own business and not be overly concerned with what other people are doing. We are not to be gossips. Speak evil of no man, Titus 3 verse 2. Paul did not want them to be lazy busybodies. Everyone should provide for themselves, so they don't have to be parasites needing to live off of other people by having others pay for them, 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 10 to 12. They had already commanded them to quietly mind their own business and to work with their own hands to provide for themselves when they were with them. In order to walk honestly toward those who are without Christ, the lost, this way they would not lack money to buy what they need and would be self-sufficient, taking personal responsibility. They would then be good examples and respectable Christian witnesses to the lost. Our witness would suffer if we had to ask others to pay for us. 13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. They are to walk in hope. The Thessalonians had been suffering severe persecution. Some may have been killed as martyrs or died for other reasons. 1 colon 6 3 colon 2 3 There were some at Thessalonica who were apprehensive about if their dead friends and family members in Christ would take part in the rapture. Paul answers their question regarding their dead loved ones in Christ. The apostle comforts them concerning those believers who had died and instructs them concerning their own hope of the Lord's return. Those who are asleep refers to the dead in Christ. For 16. We suffer and are sad when a believer dies. We miss them. But Paul does not want them to sorrow as those who have no hope of eternal life with God. Their bodies sleep but will awake at the rapture. Paul did not want them to be ignorant concerning the hope of our pre-tribulation rapture. Paul uses the term ignorant nine times in his letters. In each case, they were ignorant on some topic, so Paul helps them. The word rapture comes from the Latin Vulgate Bible word for caught up which is rapimer. The Greek word for caught up is harpozo. The rapture is exclusively found in Paul's epistles. The rapture was a mystery that Christ only revealed to Paul. This makes sense, since the entire dispensation of grace in which God is forming the body of Christ to live in the heavenly places was a mystery. Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52 Notice that whenever Paul writes about the rapture, he doesn't quote Old Testament scripture because the rapture was not prophesied, but new revelation given by the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ to him. The prophets saw Christ's first and second coming, his sufferings, and his glory, 1 Peter 1 verses 10 to 12, Isaiah 53 colon 3, 60 colon 1 dash 3. 
But Paul preached what was not made known to the sons of men, Ephesians 3 verse 5, because it was not searchable in the scriptures. Paul preached the unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 8, the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, Ephesians 3 verse 9. Why did God keep the mystery a secret? Because if Satan had known that Christ's death would allow the Father to give his spirit to two groups of believers, he would not have allowed Christ to be crucified. Satan did not know that he lost both, the earth and his place in heaven until he heard what Paul said. Paul said, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 6 to 8. Christ has two groups of believers, a prophesied group and an unprophesied group, to live in his kingdom, consisting of two realms heaven and earth. What about unbelievers, what happens to them? In the past in prophecy, Believers were gathered to their people by angels to Abraham's bosom, paradise, Luke 16, 22, 23, 43. The Bible tells us the horrible truth of what happens to unbelievers. For what is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained riches, when God taketh away his soul? This is the portion of a wicked man with God, and the heritage of oppressors, which they shall receive of the Almighty. The rich man shall lie down, but he shall not be gathered, he openeth his eyes, he opens the eyes of his soul, and he is not, he realizes he is not in his body. Terrors take hold on him as waters, he feels like he is drowning, a tempest stealeth him away in the night. The east wind carrieth him away, a spiritual tempest or east wind blows his soul to hell, and he departeth, and as a storm hurleth him out of his place. For God shall cast upon him, and not spare, he would fain flee out of his hand, he would like to escape from God, being taken to hell where there is no exit, but he can't. Men shall clap their hands at him and shall hiss him out of his place, he will receive cruel treatment by the others in hell. Job 27, 8, 13, 19-23 The pit will swallow him up and shut her mouth on him. Psalm 69 verse 15 If someone is in prison, they have the possibility of getting out but no one is getting out of God's prison, which is hell. Knowing, therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11. The justice of God demands that he judge sin. Most people are ignorant of the eternal danger they are in, therefore, in our walk, we try to help as many people as possible to be saved. 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This is another proof text that Jesus is God. Paul says that if we have believed that Jesus died and rose again, God will likewise, even so, bring with him those which sleep in Jesus, died believing who Jesus was and what he did for them, when he comes for us. Jesus will bring with him the souls and spirits of the believers when he comes for us. Paul is confident that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body, and to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Philippians 1 verse 21. Our inner man, Ephesians 3 verse 16, or inward man, Romans 7 verses 22 and 2 Corinthians 4 16, is composed of our spirit and soul. When we die our spirits and souls go to God and our bodies return to dust and the ground. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it, Echol. 12 colon 7. When Rachel died in childbirth her soul separated from her body and departed but continued to exist. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, Genesis 35 verse 18. We have the blessed assurance to know that we will be raised from the dead, resurrected, and given eternal life, because Jesus was, Acts 17 verse 31. It may be that God will use a grain, Adam, of our mortal body to fashion our mortal bodies, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 37. 
Paul said that if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 17 and 20. Since Christ died and rose, we will also rise in a glorious body like his. Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. Dot. 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Paul says that he and his co-workers are speaking to them by the word of the Lord, for the third time for, colon 1, 2, 15, not by something they made up or another man made up. The Lord revealed new information to Paul. The rapture was a mystery given to Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. The Lord said that those who are alive and remain on earth when he returns shall not prevent, pre-event, go before, or precede those who died believing in him. Paul is not saying that he believes that he will be alive at the rapture. His use of we refers to the body of Christ. Of course, Christ will bring Apostle Paul's soul and spirit with him, and he will rise, and we will join him in the air, which is amazing to think about that. 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Lord himself comes suddenly to rapidly escort us through enemy territory. The heavens are not clean in his sight, Job 15 verse 15, or the stars are not pure in his sight, Job 25 verse 5. Stars is another term for angels. In this case, Satan and his fallen angels, Job 4 verse 18, Revelation 12 verse 7. Michael, the archangel, is added protection. There are three separate types of sounds at the rapture. 1. The Lord's shout is our resurrection call. We are waiting to hear our Savior say, Come on up here. Christ calls us as he did at the tomb of Lazarus. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. John 11 verse 43. Graves will not be opened. We will go through the ground or ceiling just like Christ went through doors, stones, and walls. 2. Michael is the archangel to Israel, and his voice will indicate to Israel and also the world that the rapture has occurred. It may be Israel's sign that God has restarted his prophetic program with them in which God intervenes physically on earth. The time of Jacob's trouble will be looming on the horizon, Je. 30, 7. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased, Daniel 12 verses 1 to 4. But God told John to not seal the prophecy, Revelation 22 verse 10. The tribulation is next, but the believing remnant shall be delivered through the wrath. The resurrection of believing Israel and Gentile kingdom on earth saints whose names are written in the book of life will occur to live in the promised land. Others shall be resurrected to face the judgment of the lost, Acts 24 verse 15. While on earth Jesus told Israel, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation, John 5 verses 28 and 29, Revelation 20 verses 5 and 6. The wise who believed what God said will have eternal bodies in the kingdom on earth. They will turn many to have righteousness by sharing their faith. God wants Daniel to shut up the words until the time of the end when God will implement them. Apostle John was told, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22 verse 10. At that time, God will give Israel increased knowledge of what God's words to them mean. 3. The Trump of God. A trump is the sound a trumpet makes. 
In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 and 51 Paul says, Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, be dead believers in the body of Christ when the rapture happens, but we shall all be changed, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, those alive when the rapture occurs will be changed at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. If there is a last trump, it stands to reason that there must have been a first trump. We find the first trump in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There are two blasts, a first trumpet sound, 4 16, and a last, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. The trumpet sounds have to do with two events, the resurrection of the dead and living in the body of Christ. Christ's voice was like a trumpet in Revelation 1 verses 10 and 11. We are waiting for a shout of the Lord, the voice of the archangel, and the two trump of God. 17 Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 18 Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Only when we understand the scriptural truth of our pre-tribulation rapture can we be truly comforted at the loss of loved ones and our own blessed hope. There are no signs that precede the rapture, it is imminent and could occur at any time. We are patiently waiting and looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to appear in the air, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, 1 colon 3, Titus 2 verse 13. Every believer hopes to be alive when Christ returns to rapture us. We are looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. Those of us that do not have to experience death should be very grateful. Although Paul has said that for us death is like falling asleep and waking up in the presence of Christ. Regardless of whether we wake or sleep, we will meet Christ in the air. It is comforting to know we will have eternal life with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul never tells us to prepare for the tribulation or that Christ's coming for us is anything to fear. We can comfort one another with the Lord's words to us because we have a joyful and good hope, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 16, in the mouth of two or three witnesses that truth is established. Christ told us three times that we should be delivered from the wrath to come, Romans 5 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1 10, 5 colon 9, by and by, with joy increasing, and with gratitude unceasing, lifted up. With Christ forevermore to be, I will join the hosts there singing, in the anthem ever ringing, to the King of Love who ransomed me, from the hymn He Ransomed Me by J. W. Henderson, 1916. The certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture becomes obvious when we understand the difference between prophecy and mystery. We need to know both, all the counsel of God. The key is to know that the body of Christ began in Acts 9 with Paul's salvation on the road to Damascus, not in Acts 2. Acts 2 is a continuation of Christ's earthly ministry, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when mostly Jewish believers are added to the little flock of kingdom on earth believers, Luke 12 verse 33, Acts 2 verses 41 and 47, 514. The rapture will be a secret meeting. Christ's coming will not be seen or heard by unbelievers, but some may see a light high in the sky. Just like Paul's companions did not hear the voice or see Jesus, but only saw the light when Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, Acts 22 verses 9 and 14. Only members of the body of Christ will hear his resurrection call. Asterisk notice that Christ does not come all the way down to earth, but meets us in the air in the clouds of the first heaven. The clouds in the stratosphere are about 20,000 miles up, but the highest clouds are about 76,000 to 85,000 miles high in the mesosphere. Christ will escort us safely through the second heaven, into the third heaven. The graves will not be disturbed because our glorious bodies will go through the ground and ceilings.
Just like Christ, after his resurrection, went through a stone and closed doors. John 20 verse 26. A first and a last trump at the rapture. The trump of God. A trump is the sound a trumpet makes. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 and 51 Paul says, Behold, I shew you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, be dead believers in the body of Christ when the rapture happens, but we shall all be changed, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, those alive when the rapture occurs will be changed at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. If there is a last trump, it stands to reason that there must have been a first trump. We find the first trump in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There are two blasts, a first trumpet sound, 4 16, and a last, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. The trumpet sounds have to do with two events, the resurrection of the dead and living in the body of Christ. Christ's voice was like a trumpet in Revelation 1 verses 10 and 11. Detailed drawing of the three sounds at the rapture. Notice the timing and events of the first and last trumpet blasts. The rapture was a mystery given to Apostle Paul. Christ is our hope as he comes to meet us in the air. Rapture, mystery. An unprophesied mystery only revealed to Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, before the tribulation, Romans 5 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1 10, 5 colon 9, not in conjunction with a battle Christ comes with them also which sleep in Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 14, Christ comes in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, imminent not preceded by signs, times, or seasons. We wait, Romans 8 verse 23, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. Gathered and accompanied by Christ himself, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, an event accompanied by the voice of an archangel, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, those taken, or caught up are believers, Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17. Quick exit in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, Christ returns to heaven with the church, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, next is the judgment seat of Christ for service, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, we shall appear with Christ in glory, Colossians 3 verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13, Paul preached the gospel to every creature and no end came. Colossians 1 verse 23, a joyful blessed hope. 2 Thessalonians 2 16, 3 colon 5, Titus 2 verse 13. Second coming of Christ to earth in prophecy. Christ comes to judge his enemies and stand on the Mount of Olives. Second coming, prophecy, prophesied many times. Deuteronomy 30 verse 3. Daniel 2 verses 34 and 35, Matthew 2400 hours 30, 26, colon 64, John 14 verses 3 and 28, Acts 1 verses 10 and 11, 220, Jude 14, 15, Revelation 19 verses 11 to 16, 22, 20, after the tribulation, Matthew 24 verses 29 to 31, Christ comes with his mighty angels. Matthew 25 verse 31, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7. Preceded by signs in the sun, moon, and stars, Joel 2 verses 30 to 32, Matthew 24 verse 29, Christ begins his extended return in heaven, Isaiah 34 verse 5, Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 14 20, 16 colon 14 17, Luke 17 verse 37, Obvious dramatic, coming all will see him, Matthew 24 verses 27 and 28, Zechariah 12 verse 10, Christ comes to the earth on the Mount of Olives, Acts 1 verses 11 and 12, Zechariah 14 verse 4, Christ returns as King of Kings, Revelation 19 verse 16, removes unbelievers, tears, Matthew 13 verses 24 to 43, 2400 hours 40, 41, Christ comes to judge the nations. 
Matthew 25 verses 31 to 36, preach gospel in all the world and then the end comes, Matthew 24 verses 13 and 14, those taken are unbelievers or tares, Matthew 24 verse 41, a sad and dreadful day, Zechariah 12 verse 10, Malachi 4 verse 5, similarities between the rapture and the second coming. The time of coming rapture is unknown, and the time of second coming is unknown, as a thief to unbelievers Matthew 24 verses 36 and 1 Thessalonians 5 colon 2, 2 Peter 3 verse 10, but the second coming can be calculated by believers after the signing of the covenant by Antichrist. Christ comes and there are clouds and trumpet sounds and one or more angels. Christ the Lord is risen today, Him by Charles Wesley, 1739, Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing, ye heavens and earth, reply, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O death, is now thy sting? Alleluia. Once he died our souls to save, Alleluia. Where thy victory, O grave, Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done, Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battle won, Alleluia. Death in vain forbids his rise, Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise, Alleluia. Soar we now where Christ hath led, Alleluia. Following our exalted head, Alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise, Alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies, Alleluia. Hail the Lord of earth and heaven, Alleluia. Praise to thee, by both be given, Alleluia. Thee we greet triumphant now, Alleluia. Hail the resurrection, thou, Alleluia. King of glory, soul of bliss, Alleluia. Everlasting life is this, Alleluia. Thee to know, thy power to prove, Alleluia. Thus, to sing, and thus to love, Alleluia. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 emphasizes that the living in Christ will be changed, while 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 emphasizes that the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 The Model Walk and the Day of the Lord 5 colon 1-11 Walk in Light 5 12 13 Walk in Gratitude 5 colon 14-28 Walk in Obedience to God's Will To truly understand the mystery of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, it is essential to understand the distinction between mystery and prophecy. We are to study the Bible rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The Greek word for rightly dividing is orthotomio, which means to cut straight. Acts 9 is the first straight cut. The last straight cut is the rapture. We divide the word of truth where God divides it. God divides between Christ's. Appearing to Saul, Paul, of Tarsus on the road to Damascus from Christ's appearing to rapture the body of Christ. We are living in a parenthesis, between these two appearings, in the dispensation of grace. These appearings are easily seen in Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, Christ began an all-men ministry when he saved Paul in Acts 9, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we hope to be raptured before we die. Titus 2 verses 11 to 13. We live soberly during the dispensation of grace, believing true sound doctrine. We separate Paul's instructions to us in Romans, to Philemon, from the rest of the Bible. Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. We study the rest of the Bible from a Pauline point of view. The mystery, the church will have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air, for 17. We are not going through the tribulation. The church, the body of Christ is saved from having any part in it. Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come, 110. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9. The body of Christ believers are of the day, the dispensation of grace, not the night, the tribulation, although we live in the night, this present evil world, Galatians 1 verse 4, 
Romans 13 verse 11. We will be saved out of the world. The evil world will continue into the tribulation, the darkness of God's wrath, for those not raptured because they received not the love of the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. 5 colon 1 But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Paul said that there is no need for him to write about the times and the seasons concerning the second coming of Christ, because we are not going to be here. The mystery, the church that has been cut free, we will have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air, For 17. We are not going through the tribulation. The church, the body of Christ is saved from having any part in it. Notice that Paul declares the sequence of events. Having talked about the rapture of the church, he then moves on to the day of the Lord in the prophetic program. Times and seasons do not apply to the body of Christ, they belong to Israel's prophetic program after the rapture. God relates to Israel on the basis of signs, the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. The King James Bible is so wonderful in that the same exact words or phrases are often used. The Bible is no ordinary book, and our God is no ordinary God. The beauty of having all of God's word in one language, English for example, and not in two languages, Hebrew and Greek, is that exact words and phrases can be found and cross-referenced in the Old and New Testaments. Using the same phrase, the prophet Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar what God does. And he changeth the times and the seasons, he removeth kings, and setteth up kings, he giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Daniel 2 verse 21 God sets up and takes down kingdoms. After the tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 29, Christ will come and take down the Gentile rule, destroy Antichrist, set himself up as the true king, and reign over the whole world for a thousand years. Therefore, there is no need for Paul to write to the Thessalonians about the things that have nothing to do with them. The church, the body of Christ, is looking for a person, not for times and seasons. The body of Christ will be caught up to meet our head. We will be joined to our head, so we can be one new man. Ephesians 2 verse 15 When Christ comes for the body of Christ, he does not come all the way to the earth, but meets us in the air. Verse 17 The rapture is not in Matthew 24. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, in judgment, just as the ones were taken in the flood, and the other left, to enter the kingdom. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Matthew 24 verses 40 and 41. 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Notice the progression of time, having talked about the rapture. Chapter 4. Paul next discusses the day of the Lord. Paul describes the tribulation to show that we are not going through it, but we will be raptured before it. We, the body of Christ, will be gone. Israel is appointed to go through the tribulation because it is the last installment of the fifth course of punishment for their spiritual adultery, as mentioned in Leviticus 26 verses 27 to 39. But God promises to spare those who at that time will confess Israel's iniquity and accept their punishment, Leviticus 26 verses 40 to 46. Israel should not be surprised when they are going through the wrath, because it has been prophesied. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. 1 Peter 4 verse 12. Jesus said that unless those days were shortened no one would survive that time, but God shortened them for the sake of the believers. Matthew 24 verse 22. The tribulation will come upon unbelieving Israel and others who do not study the word of God as a thief in the night. But the wise, those who read the Bible, will not be taken by surprise. The wise will build their life on the rock, Jesus Christ, Matthew 7 verse 24, not on the sand or clay in the feet and toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, Antichrist. The ten confederate kings or toes are most likely kings of the nations mentioned in Psalm 83 verses 5 to 8. The remnant of believers in Israel believe that Jesus of Nazareth, who already came according to Daniel's timeline of 490 years, is their Messiah. 
Those who agree that Christ has already come in the flesh will be the true believers in the tribulation, 1 John 4 verse 2. The tribulation is the last seven years of Daniel's timeline for when Messiah will come to Israel and set things right. Daniel's timeline began with the order to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem, May 2, 6. It is also the last seven years, the times of the Gentiles, Luke 21 verse 24. God had never let a nation besides Israel rule over Jerusalem, the city of the great king, Matthew 5 verse 35, until Babylon. The times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, Daniel 2 verse 38, invasion and rule of Israel. At his second coming, Christ comes as the stone that smote, Daniel 2 verse 35, and puts down all opposition to his reign over Israel and the earth, Daniel 2 verses 44 and 45. Some people include the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, Je. 30 colon 7, in the day of the Lord and others do not. Others teach that day of the Lord begins with the second coming of Christ. Everyone can agree that after the rapture, God again resumes intervening physically in the earth. In the dispensation of grace, God is manifesting himself to the world spiritually through believers, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, and is not intervening physically. Peter says that the day of the Lord lasts until the first heaven and earth are burned up. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3 verse 10. This is the only other exact reference to the phrase thief in the night. Christ commands the tribulation saints to watch for him and says he will come as a thief, Matthew 24 verses 42 to 51. They, their countrymen who troubled the Thessalonians and the Jews that persecuted the little flock, these unbelievers will not escape God's vengeance, 2 colon 14 16. For the unbelievers, the day of the Lord will come upon them suddenly and unexpectedly as a thief in the night. Christ warns that he comes upon unbelievers as a thief. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Revelation 16 verse 15. 3 For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. If the imminent rapture were to happen, then their persecutors would go into the tribulation. They would believe that the man of sin, Antichrist, would bring in peace and safety. This verse includes the beginning and end of the tribulation. The seven years of tribulation are divided into the first three twelve years and the last three twelve years. Paul has been using the pronouns you and ye and yourselves, but now he begins using they and them. The they are all the enemies of God who will receive his wrath. The wrath of God has come upon their own unbelieving countrymen who persecuted the Thessalonians, as it has on the unbelieving Jews that persecuted Peter's group in Jerusalem, to the uttermost eternal torment, as mentioned in 2.16. They despise God and hinder the Holy Spirit's work and his word through the saved to the lost, 4.6.8. In the first three and a half years, unbelievers in Israel will say peace and safety, then in the second three and a half years, sudden destruction will come upon them like labor on a woman having a baby. Labor starts at an unpredictable time. Labor begins slowly and then becomes stronger and harder. God will pour out the seven seals, trumpets, and vials. This is the false peace and safety of the real imposter Antichrist. God promised peace to believers I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him, Isaiah 57 verse 19. The Jews thought Christ was the imposter, but he was the genuine son of God. Although all seven of the years will be very difficult with so many falling away from the truth, Christ calls the last half of the seven years the great tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21. Speaking of that time, their apostle John wrote, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world leath in wickedness, 1 John 5 verse 19. Those who hinder God's word will not escape. His enemies shall not escape Christ's judgment of them at his second coming. 
For but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Paul reminds the Thessalonian believers that they are not in the darkness of Satan, that the day of the Lord should overtake them as a thief, Colossians 1 verse 13. They are not going to suddenly find themselves in the tribulation. Paul will use a series of contrasts to show. The difference of where they are on God's timeline, darkness and light, day and night, sober and drunk, and hope and wrath. A thief sneaks in unexpectedly when no one is looking. We are to be confidently, eagerly, and actively looking for our great God and Savior. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Titus 2 verse 13 Even those who are saved and are not looking for him will be raptured with us. Even wrong dividers who wrongly preach and teach the post-tribulation rapture, such as R.C. Sproul and Stephen Anderson, will be going up with us in the rapture. Paul was sent to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Acts 26 verse 18. We have been delivered from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1 verse 13. The rapture will be the redemption of the entire body of Christ for his glory, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1 verse 14. The day of the Lord is first mentioned in Isaiah 2 verse 12. The day of the Lord is often called that day in prophecy, Amos 8 verse 9. It will be a day of vengeance on unbelievers, but joy for believers in prophecy. 5 Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. We are the children of light, with Christ's light in us, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 40 and the children of the day, the dispensation of grace, not of the night, the tribulation, although we live in this present evil world, Galatians 1 verse 4. We are looking for the day of our redemption, the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, Romans 8 verse 23. We are in the day of grace, the dispensation of grace. The lost are Satan's darkness, Acts 26 verse 18. The night is the tribulation, the evil world continues into the tribulation, the darkness of God's wrath, for those not raptured because they received not the love of the truth, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. Dot. 6. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Sleep here has changed meaning. Paul now uses it to refer to people who are asleep to the truth, not died believing in Christ. We are to be awake to the truth, alert, serving God, and watching for Christ's return. We live soberly believing true sound doctrine, Romans to Philemon, and the rest of the Bible from a Pauline point of view, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Dot. 7. For they that sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. People sleep at night, and that is usually when they are drunk. Unbelievers are asleep to the things of God, such as the gospel Paul preached, and many are drunk on false doctrine. We need to be awake to the truth. It is night for those who do not believe the truth. In order to avoid being hopelessly confused about the rapture, we need to differentiate between Christ's ministry to the body of Christ through Paul and Christ's ministry to Israel through the twelve. To truly understand the mystery of the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51, it is essential to understand the distinction between mystery and prophecy. We are to study the Bible rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. The Greek word for rightly dividing is orthotomio, which means to cut straight. Acts 9 is the first straight cut. The last straight cut is the rapture. We divide the word of truth where God divides it. God divides between Christ's appearing to Saul, Paul, of Tarsus on the road to Damascus from Christ's appearing to rapture the body of Christ. We are living in a parenthesis between these two appearings in the dispensation of grace. These appearings are easily seen in Titus. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Christ began an all-men ministry when he saved Paul in Acts 9, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, 
and godly, in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, we hope to be raptured before we die. Titus 2 verses 11 to 13. We live soberly during the dispensation of grace, believing true sound doctrine. We separate Paul's instructions to us in Romans, to Philemon, from the rest of the Bible. Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. We study the rest of the Bible from a Pauline point of view. Today, we follow the instructions Christ gave us through Paul, not his instructions through Peter. To follow Peter when God told us to follow Paul is to follow false doctrine, 1 Corinthians 4 16, 11, colon 1, Philippians 3 verse 17, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, 2 14, the drunken have drunk the wine of false doctrine, which is also associated in the Bible with wine of fornication, Ephesians 5 verse 18, Revelation 17 verse 2, dot. 8 But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. But let us who are awake in the day of the dispensation of grace and reserved for the day of the raptured, be sober, clear-headed. We have peace in our hearts and minds knowing that because of Christ, we are not going through the tribulation. We are to look for the day of our catching up at the end of the dispensation of grace, be sober, putting on our armor like good soldiers. Jesus Christ is our armor of light as mentioned in Romans 13 verses 11 to 13. The breastplate of faith and love covers our heart. It is the faith of Christ that carries us, and it is his love. These are the fruit of his spirit in us, Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. It is interesting that Paul calls it the breastplate of righteousness in Ephesians 6 verse 14. Like a helmet, our minds are protected by the hope of salvation from having to go through the tribulation. This is a great stabilizing fact that gives us joy and makes us mentally strong. This truth quickly establishes our minds preventing any doubt and despair. Believers can face almost any trouble, difficult circumstances, health issues, or situations if we are certain of our destination with the Lord. The blessed assurance that we will be with Him in heaven without having to go through the tribulation has a great stabilizing effect on our mind, heart, and will. We know the truth of what Christ said to us through Paul. 9 For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Again Paul confirms that the body of Christ is not appointed to going through the tribulation. We are destined to be caught up to Christ. He wrote this same thing in Romans 5 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10. We will be saved from having to endure that horrible time on the earth. We are appointed to obtain deliverance from the wrath by our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 10 Who died for us, that, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Jesus is the one who suffered and died for us, so we don't have to. Whether we are alive or dead in Christ, sleep, when he comes to meet us, our rapture is certain. The best part about heaven is that we should live together with him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who will make heaven such a wonderful place. We will joyfully worship, adore, and give him all the glory. 11. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. They, and we, can be comforted because they are not appointed to wrath. God will render rest to them and tribulation to their persecutors. We can comfort each other with the truth of the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52. The certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture is a comfort. Going through the tribulation would not be a comfort. Paul tells them to keep comforting and edifying each other, just like they were. 12 And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. 13 And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. Know who the true workers are among you, who teach you the true word, that Christ revealed to us through Paul. Colossians 1 verses 23 to 26. Value your teachers. Esteem them in love, hold them in high regard, for their work's sake. 
When we read or hear the word of God, it can admonish or correct us. The water of God's word cleanses us, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5 verse 26. Jesus told the disciples, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15 verse 3. Be at peace among yourselves. Means be in harmony like one team and not to fight or bicker. 14 Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. The unruly are those who will not obey the rules. Paul urges them to warn those who are unruly by not working to provide for themselves. Comfort the feeble-minded who are unsure about the rapture and what God's word says. Support the weak in the faith and the weak in their body who may need financial help. Be patient to all men means don't lose your temper because it will harm your testimony and God's reputation. 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. We are not to avenge ourselves. That is God's job. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 12. We follow after what is good and let God do the recompense to those who treat us badly. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as leaf in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst. Give him drink, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12 verses 17 to 21. Dot. 16 Rejoice evermore. We can rejoice because we are not going through the wrath and Christ has done everything to save us and to give us the gift of eternal life. Romans 6 verse 23. We will be with him in heaven forever. For 17. Dot. 17 Pray without ceasing. We can get up in the morning and say a little prayer such as, Please help me to serve you, today, and then add to that prayer throughout the day as things come up, or as you think about them. Pray for others to be saved and to have spiritual knowledge, like Paul did in his prison epistles. Then, at the end of the day, thank God that we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3 we maintain a constant attitude of prayer while exalting our Lord Jesus Christ. When we do this, then everything else falls into its proper place. 18 In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We can give thanks that we are saved from hell and from having to go through the tribulation. We thank God in everything, not for every circumstance or situation. It is God's will for us to be grateful. 19. Quench, not the Spirit. They were to allow the Spirit to move freely among themselves. We are not to grieve the Spirit in us by disobeying, behaving badly, thinking badly, not being gracious, or harboring unforgiveness. Ephesians 5 verses 25 to 30. Dot. 20. Despise, not prophesyings. The Thessalonian letters were written during the Acts period when the sign gifts were still in effect. Prophesy was one of the sign gifts. All the sign gifts have ceased, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 13. But at that time, the prophets in mystery spoke by the Spirit, those things that the Lord Jesus Christ had already revealed through Apostle Paul. The signs gifts ceased after Paul arrived in Rome, having the full revelation of the mystery even if he had not written it down yet, Romans 15 verse 29. In Acts 28 verse 28, Paul put Israel aside for the third and final time, although Jews can still be saved if they believe the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. This is when the sign gifts ceased. The church was in its spiritual infancy and saw through a glass, darkly during Acts, before Paul understood the mystery which Christ was progressively revealing to him. At that time, sign gifts were needed to get the church going, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 13. 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 
They were to prove, test, or discern if the prophecies were from God or not. If they lined up with the word of God, which Paul preached, 1 Corinthians 5, 4, 1437, or not, they could hold fast to that which is good, true prophesies. Today, we prove all teachings by the scripture, the pure word of God rightly divided. In English, the pure word of God is found in the King James Bible. 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil, both spiritual and physical adultery. No one should have any reason to doubt our integrity as far as our faith or morality. 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants the God of peace to sanctify them completely, spirit, soul, and body, and to preserve them blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The God of peace saves us from having to go through the wrath. We are preserved blameless unto his coming if we follow Christ's doctrine to us through Paul, which is able to keep us stable, unblameable, and holy. 313. We do not accomplish a blameless walk above sin and self by our own effort or rule-keeping. The doctrine does the work in us effectually. Right thinking produces right action. The very God of peace does the sanctifying by his living spirit in us and his living word to us. God is the one who is able to sanctify us wholly or completely and give us peace in the midst of persecution or difficult circumstances. We have the comfort of the scriptures that give us hope, Romans 15 verse 4. Paul prays that God will preserve us blameless in our spirit, soul, and body until the rapture. We can trust the God of peace. This is a very important verse in the Bible because it is the only verse that includes all three parts of our triune nature, three in one, although each part is mentioned separately in other verses. God works in us from the inside out, while Satan attacks us from the outside in. Satan attacks our minds by trying to make us doubt our blessed hope of the rapture. Our goal and mystery is to live in heaven with Christ forever. Psychologists need to know this truth about our makeup if they are seeking to help someone. Man is a triune being. The word of God differentiates between spirit and soul. The spirit in our mind is the part of us that is able to communicate with God and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4 verse 23. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. The soul is our true self or heart, the seat of our affections, will, desires, and emotions. Spirit is pneuma in Greek, nephesh in Hebrew, soul is sush in Greek, ruach in Hebrew, body is soma in Greek. 24 Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. We can trust the God of peace. God called them, and us, by the gospel. He will preserve us as we live by faith in the true sound doctrine he has given us through Paul. God justifies and sanctifies us by faith. Christ will keep us in true doctrine if we care to understand his word to us through Paul. God is faithful not only to save us, but to keep us by his spirit in us and his word to us. Philippians 1, 6, 2, 13, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 3 and 4. God will keep us until he will rapture us. God will do it. 25 Brethren, pray for us. Paul asks them to pray for them, too. 26 Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. 27 I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Paul asks them to give the other believers a holy kiss from him. In our culture, a handshake or wave will. Do. Paul charges or commands them by the Lord to have this letter read to all the other believers. Paul said he wrote what Christ revealed directly to him, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 15, 5, 27. As the word of God to the Gentiles grew, making copies of the word of God became one of the primary functions of the local church. God saw to it that the Greek New Testament was preserved just as the Hebrew scribes preserved the Old Testament. The local church is responsible to teach and maintain the Bible, to be the church of the living God the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15. 28 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul closes the letter, simply, by exalting Christ. 
It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we all have. Paul wants us kept by his grace, walking by faith in his doctrine to us through Paul. 1 Thessalonians Chapter Summaries Chapter 1 How the Thessalonians were saved and their work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Chapter 2 Paul's Ministry in Thessalonica Satan had hindered Paul twice from coming to Thessalonica. When Paul could no longer stand the suspense of how they were holding up in the face of strong persecution, he sent a model brother because he was hindered from going to them himself. Paul got around the tempter, Satan, by sending brother Timothy and Silas to check on them and to establish them in the faith. In other words, they were sent to do after care. Paul wanted to be sure that these saints were not moved away from the faith, the doctrine he taught them, but would thrive and grow. Paul wanted to perfect that which may be lacking in their faith. He longed to teach them more sound doctrine. Chapter 3, Timothy's Visit and Good Report Paul is happy that they want to see them again and are standing fast in the faith they delivered to them. Chapter 4, Living to Please God and the Details of Our Pre-Tribulation Rapture Chapter 5, Following the Rapture Comes the Day of the Lord, which the Church has no part in because the body of Christ is not appointed to wrath. When will the Rapture occur? Paul does not give us a date for the Lord's return for us, but asks us to patiently wait for Him. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. No one except God knows when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Romans 11 verse 25. The rapture is imminent, it could occur at any time. I do not pretend to know when the rapture will actually happen, but I think that we can make an educated guess of the most likely window of time that the rapture will occur. However, human speculation has often proved to be wrong. I am going to share when I think the rapture may occur for the purpose of urging all of us to be busy doing God's will. We know it is God's will that as many people will be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth as possible. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 We are also to lay up rewards in heaven. God will judge what sort of work we did, the quality, not the quantity. How much work did we allow Christ to do through us? How many souls did we share the gospel with and edify? To understand when the rapture will occur, we need to look at prophecy, because there are no signs in mystery. God gave the world the seven-day week, Genesis 2 verses 2 and 3. Then in Exodus, he gave Israel the Sabbath day, Exodus 20 verse 8. The Sabbath day is a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. It will be a period of rest for him and his people. For we which have believed do enter into rest, kingdom, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Hebrews 4 verses 3 and 4. Could it be that God has a 7,000 year planned for mankind? Christ did not come 2,000 years after his birth, so perhaps he will come 2,000 years after his death? God gave Daniel the timeline for his people in Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. Daniel 9 verse 24 70 weeks, 490 years, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9 verse 25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks, forty-nine years, and threescore and two weeks, four hundred and thirty-four years, plus forty-nine equals four eighty-three. Christ declared himself to be the King of the Jews when he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times, Nehemiah. Daniel 9 verse 26 And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, die on the cross at the same time, but not for himself, and the people of the prince, Antichrist, that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Daniel 9 verse 27 And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, 
he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, Antichrist will set himself up to be worshipped, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. God gave Daniel the timeline for his people, Daniel 9 verses 24 to 27. 70 weeks of 7 is 70 times 7 or 490 years. There would be 483 years until Messiah the Prince would come. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be 7 weeks and 3 score and 2 weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Daniel 9 verse 25. Here are the calculations. 1. After the 7 by 7 weeks or 49 years will be 62 by 7 weeks or 434 years. There were 49 years from the building of the wall by Nehemiah in which the temple at Jerusalem were rebuilt. The temple took 46 years, John 2 verse 20. 2. Then there was 400 years of silence, Amos 8 verse 11. 3. Then 34 years unto Messiah the Prince, Daniel 9 verse 25, which is Palm. Sunday, when Christ declared himself to be the King of the Jews. 4. This is 69 weeks, or a total of 483 years. God inserted the dispensation of grace between the 69 and 70th week, and interrupted prophecy. The 70th week is the wrath, or tribulation, that will occur after our rapture. Notice that Messiah arrived and died in A.D. 34. I believe Dionysius Exiguus A.D. 470-540, who was commissioned by Pope John I to work out the date of Christ's death in A.D. 525, for the purpose of knowing when Easter occurred for our calendar, did it correctly. Dionysius was a monk from Scythia, modern-day Romania, an astronomer, and a brilliant mathematician. He traveled to Jerusalem and may have had access to documents that no longer exist. Based on his findings, he instituted B.C., before Christ, and A.D., in the year of our Lord, for our calendar. Dionysius established that Easter should be celebrated the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs after the spring equinox, March 21st. He set our calendar on firm footing. It coincides with the true date of the death of Jesus. He correctly deduced that Jesus died in A.D. 34 on Thursday. Christ said that the only sign he would give for his death was, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12 verse 40. Therefore, in order to fulfill the sign of Jonas, Jonah, and rise on Sunday, Matthew 28 verse 1, Christ would have had to die on Thursday. This means that Passover had to begin at sunset on Wednesday. We must keep in mind that the Jewish days begin in the evening, at sunset. The date for the Passover changes from year to year. Using the Torah calendar, I determined that the only year around that time that the Passover began on a Wednesday was in A.D. 34. I believe Christ was conceived around December 25th in 1 B.C. Notice there is no year zero and that Christ was born in A.D. 1. Knowing that John the Baptist was born six months earlier helps with this reckoning. Christ lived 33 12 years, so if we add 1 plus 33, we get A.D. 34. Romans 5 verse 8 KJV But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Three days and three nights timetable. The above timeline was created and shared publicly by Sean Brousseau. Keep in mind that the Jewish day goes from evening to evening, so Passover began on Wednesday at sunset, 6 p.m., and finished on Thursday at sunset, 6 p.m. In my book, Could God Have a 7,000-Year Plan for Mankind? I give these possible dates. Jesus probably died on Passover Abib, Nissan, 14 at 3 p.m., March 24, A.D. 34. Jesus rose Abib, Nissan, 17, March 27, A.D. 34. Jesus ascended on Omer Day 40, E.R. or Ziv 25, May 3, A.D. 34. The Holy Ghost came Omer Day 50, Sivan 6, Shavuot, Pentecost, May 13, A.D. 34. 
When did Jesus die? It is not enough for a Christian to believe in God, a Christian must believe God. Believing is taking God at his word. When Jesus gave us the sign for his death, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12 verse 40. We must trust that what he said is true. Therefore, in order to find out when Jesus died, we simply have to line up the facts with the Hebrew calendar. Jesus must have been in the tomb three days and three nights and risen on Sunday. Making the match is easy using the website TorahCalendar.com. Nisan, Aramaic, is the same month as Abib, Hebrew. After comparing all the years from AD 26 to 34, we find a match with AD 34. Jesus died on Passover, Nisan 14, which began on Wednesday at sunset and concluded Thursday at sunset. Jesus died on Thursday, not Friday, to allow for the three days and nights. Because a Friday crucifixion would only mean two nights. This means Jesus would have had to die on a Thursday before sunset in order to be in the tomb three days and three nights and to rise on Sunday. The Hebrew days go from sunset to sunset. So, Passover, Nisan 14, would need to begin on Wednesday, at sunset. If we plug several years into the Torah calendar, starting in AD 26, for example, and continue plugging in the number of years incrementally, we discover the only date that fits is the year AD 34. Here are the results anyone can find using the patented calendar on the website TorahCalendar.com. Comparing the following years, remember that Nissan 14 must begin on Wednesday, for Christ to die on Thursday that same day. AD 26 Nissan 14 is on Friday. AD 27 Nissan 14 is on Thursday. AD 28 Nissan 14 is on Tuesday. AD 29 Nissan 14 is on Monday. AD 30 Nissan 14 is on Friday. AD 31 Nissan 14 is on Tuesday. AD 32 Nissan 14 is on Monday. AD 33 Nissan 14 is on Friday. AD 34 Nissan 14 is on Wednesday. Notice that Passover begins on Wednesday, Nissan 14, and finishes at sunset the following day on the pictured Torah calendar. Torah calendar for Nissan, Abib, 34 AD, 7,000 years. In a mere 7,000 years, God will have determined who had faith to believe in him and will live in heaven or on earth. The week in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is a pattern for God's plan. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Hebrews 4 verse 4 Explanation of Torah calendar Abib in AD 34 Keep in mind that the Jewish day goes from evening to evening, so Passover began on Wednesday at sunset, 6 p.m., and finished on Thursday at sunset, 6 p.m. In that book, I give these possible dates. Jesus probably died on Passover Abib, Nisan, 14 at 3 p.m., March 24, A.D. 34. Jesus rose Abib, Nisan, 17, March 27, A.D. 34. Jesus ascended on Omer Day 40, E.R., or Ziv 25, May 3, A.D. 34. The Holy Ghost came Omer Day 50, Savon 6, Shavuot, Pentecost, May 13, A.D. 34. However, we know that there is an unspecified time before Antichrist signs the seven-year covenant with Israel. This time period cannot be very long since the little flock sold their belongings as Christ commanded them because the tribulation loomed on the horizon, Luke 12 verse 33, Acts 2 45, 4 34. They cashed in their property because they would not be able to take the mark of the beast and buy and sell in the tribulation. Revelation 13 verses 16 to 18. In Peter's day, people were getting impatient saying, where is the promise of his coming? 2 Peter 3 verse 4. I remind you that the rapture could happen at any time. And that, knowing the time, that now it is. High time to awake out of sleep, for now, is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Romans 13 verse 11. The high time is when the sand in the hourglass is high. Just a few more grains of sand and time will have run out. 
The rapture will happen, and we will be saved from the wrath to come. Romans 5 verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, 5, colon 9. Maybe today, Lord. The prophetic clock stopped on Palm Sunday and was followed by the cross when Messiah was cut off. Daniel 9 verse 26. The nation of Israel then received a bonus year to accomplish a renewed offer of the kingdom through the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost. The one-year extension of mercy was a result of Christ's plea to the Father on their behalf. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, 23 34. This extra bonus year is not included in Daniel's 490 years. The Holy Ghost came down to empower the little flock ten days after Christ ascended to the Father, having ministered to his disciples for forty days after his death, on Pentecost, Acts 1, 3, 2, 1-4. Julius Caesar began the Julian calendar in 46 BC, 365.25 days. Pope Gregory reformed the calendar in 1582, adjusting for the more precise solar year of the Gregorian calendar, 365.2425 days. Some historians, such as Bishop Usher, believe there is a four-year discrepancy in the calendar. Furthermore, many believe that Herod the Great died in 3 BC. In that case, our rapture would occur four years earlier making the window of time for our rapture between one and four years. Therefore, in 2019, I think eight years or less, while others say four years or less, because it may be true that the calendar is off by four years, since Herod the Great may have died in 4 BC. Many of us like the sound of that thinking because our gathering together unto him, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, will be sooner. Others say that the years in mystery do not apply to God's timeline because it was a mystery. I don't agree because there is not another 2,000 years before the wrath in God's timeline for mankind. Studying the Thessalonian letters confirm that. In a mere 7,000 years, God will have determined who will have eternal life with him in heaven and on earth. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Romans 9 verse 28. While mankind's calendar dates may not be perfect, we can trust that God knows exactly what time it is and precisely when he wants the rapture to occur. May we be busy working for our glorious God, ready and prepared when he comes. Let us be patient, waiting, watching, listening, and working. Maranatha. Therefore, knowing that the rapture could occur in our lifetime and at any moment, Let us be busy helping as many people as possible to believe the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4, and take part in the rapture. 2 Thessalonians Paul had used a letter to stabilize the Thessalonians, now the enemy used a letter to destabilize them. The Thessalonians were shaken in mind and troubled. Because of the forged letter as from Paul, the counterfeit letter claimed that they were suffering persecution because they were in the tribulation and had missed the rapture. Therefore, Paul writes a follow-up letter from Corinth shortly after he wrote the first letter, Acts 18 verse 11. Someone was sent from Thessalonica to check to see if Paul was still in Corinth. Paul wrote back to give them peace of mind and to comfort their hearts. Although Paul had corrected their thinking about the rapture in the first letter, they still needed further correction on the important doctrine of our hope, our glorification, and their wrong behavior. Wrong thinking leads to wrong actions. Because false doctrine had crept into the church, some were still not behaving correctly and had not gone back to work. The model church had gotten off track regarding their hope. With very logical arguments, Paul sets out to correct the false doctrine and get them back on track. First, Paul praises their faith and love. Despite their problems, the church was growing in faith and love. Paul doesn't say they are growing in their blessed hope. Next, he instructs the Thessalonians regarding our gathering together unto him, Christ, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, before the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 2. Then, Paul enumerates events concerning the day of the Lord to show that they, and we, 
are not in it. Understanding prophecy often helps us to understand mystery more clearly. Finally, after Paul has cleared up the confusion and given them comforting assurance that our rapture will precede the day of the Lord, he tells them to get back to work. Paul's letters worked effectually in them that believe. 2 Thessalonians Outline 1. Persevere despite persecution. 2. Corrects false doctrine. The day of the Lord explained, we are not in it. 3. Lazy busy bodies should go back to work and Paul's trademark signature. Review sentences 2 Thessalonians. 1. Rest with us. 2. Gathered with us. 3. Follow us in word and work. Purpose. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians. The main emphasis is doctrine. 2. 1. Encourage the saints to stay strong in their faith and to continue to grow. 2. To correct false doctrine. We are not appointed to be in the tribulation. 3. Paul describes the day of the Lord to show that they, and we, are not in it. 4. To correct the bad behavior of some who were still not working. 5. To get them back on track about their hope so the Lord of peace could give them peace of mind knowing they will be gathered to him before the wrath. Theme, the God loves us and gives us everlasting consolation and by grace good hope to comfort our hearts. This is so we can have stable minds allowing the doctrine to work effectually in us so Christ can do his work through us. Key verses, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 16 and 17. Satan had attacked their minds concerning their hope. Anyone can get off track and misunderstand some point regarding doctrine if they are not careful. We must study God's word God's way. We need to consider what Paul says first. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Sound doctrine results in a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. 1 Thessalonians emphasis 2 Thessalonians emphasis coming of Christ in the air, coming of Christ to the earth present age of grace future day of the Lord Spirit's work in the church members Satan's mystery of iniquity reminds them of what he had taught corrected false teaching they heard. 2 Thessalonians introduction. When Paul writes about the rapture, he doesn't quote Old Testament scripture because the rapture was not prophesied. This new revelation was given by the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ to him. The Thessalonian church had lost their blessed hope. If we compare 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 with 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, we notice that Paul doesn't praise their hope in the second letter. Some were telling them that the persecution they were experiencing was the tribulation. A forged letter claiming to be from Paul contained this wrong doctrine which distressed the members in the church. The Thessalonians most likely sent a messenger to Paul in Corinth to check to see if he was still here. Paul writes to correct the false doctrine and stabilize them in the truth of their pre-tribulation rapture so their hearts can be comforted. Paul writes to correct wrong thinking regarding our resurrection at the rapture. Satan frequently attacks this doctrine, 2 Timothy 2 verse 18. In chapter 15 of Corinthians, Paul also had to defend the resurrection. He said that anyone who denies our resurrection denies the resurrection of Christ. Paul calls this evil communication. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners, good behavior. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. At Thessalonica, evil communication had caused the bad behavior for some had stopped working. In 1 Thessalonians some were not working because they thought the rapture was coming at any time. Now some had quit working thinking what is the use of working when the world is coming to an end. People will come up with any excuse to not work. Work is healthy, honorable, good, responsible, and rewarding. God instituted work before the fall when he told Adam to dress and keep the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2 verse 15. Work gives us a satisfying sense of accomplishment. The tribulation leads up to the day of the Lord's return, which is bad news for his enemies, but good news for his believers. The day of the Lord extends from the seven tribulation 
then includes the second coming of Christ, his millennial reign, the great white throne judgment, and ends with fire burning and cleansing the heaven and the earth, 2 Peter 3 verse 10. The day of God, 2 Peter 3 verse 12, comes next with the new heaven and earth, 2 Peter 3 verse 13, Isaiah 65 colon 17, 66 colon 22, Revelation 21 verse 1. Paul called the day of God the dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 1 verse 10. The reason for the day of the Lord has nothing to do with the body of Christ, but is the prophesied punishment of Israel for their spiritual idolatry. The day of the Lord is first mentioned in Isaiah 2 verse 12, but it is referred to all through the Bible. It is part of the fifth course of chastisement, Leviticus 26 verses 27 to 39. Paul graciously sandwiches his correction of the doctrinal error that had crept into the church between encouragement and the comfort of our hope. This is the sandwich technique that we can use when helping to correct others in the faith. We first point out what they are doing well, then what they need to correct, and then return to bolster them in what they know to be true. Paul had a firm grasp of both prophecy and mystery. We love studying prophecy almost as much as mystery. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 Patience and Faith Despite Persecution 1 colon 1 2 Greetings 1 colon 3 dash 8 Praise for Spiritual Growth Despite Persecution 1 colon 9 dash 12 Rest with us while God recompenses your persecutors 1 13 14 His good work of faith with power in them for his and their glory Faith charity and hope are the hallmarks of the Christian faith Satan hates the doctrine of our blessed hope and had tried to attack it in Thessalonica, Corinth, and Ephesus. Paul defended the pre-tribulation rapture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He had false teachers regarding the rapture put out of the church in Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1 verse 20, 2 Timothy 2 verse 18. Although Paul had corrected doctrine regarding the rapture in his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul had to write 2 Thessalonians to correct doctrine regarding the pre-tribulation rapture once again. Despite its problems, the church had shown great promise and steadfastness. But the church was being persecuted and wavering in their blessed hope. The church at Thessalonica was growing in faith and in charity, love. But Paul doesn't say they had grown in their hope. He doesn't praise them for their hope because they were wavering in their blessed hope. Some said that their persecution indicated that they were in the tribulation. A forged letter may have said so. Left unaddressed, that false doctrine could derail the church. We can endure anything if we have hope. It is not enough to be biblical, we must also be dispensational. In order to fully understand the rapture, we need to understand the difference between mystery and prophecy. Paul uses the term dispensation four times in his letters. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, Ephesians 1 10, 3 colon 2, and Colossians 1 verse 25. However, if we try to find the word in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17 in the NIV, non-inspired version, or in the NKJV it is not there. Therefore, it is essential to use a perfect Bible. In English, it is the King James Bible. Dispensation means dispersing or distributing. A gas station dispenses gasoline, and a pharmacy dispenses medications. In the Bible, it means God is dispensing a set of instructions for people to believe and obey. 1 colon 1 Paul, and Silvanus, and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that Paul still sends the local assembly greetings from Silvanus, Timotheus, and himself is a clue that this letter was written shortly after the first. Silvanus is mentioned in retrospect in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 19, and as the scribe for Peter, 1 Peter 5 verse 12, but after that, he is not mentioned again. This second letter was probably written shortly after the first. Perhaps a Thessalonian had been sent to see if Paul was still in Corinth or if he had been raptured. This person brought news concerning the church and the heresy in the assembly. Paul greets them cordially, acknowledging that the members of the church there are in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ.
to grace unto you, and peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul greets them as was his custom with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He is their spokesman, their chosen apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. We are living during a period of amnesty when God is freely offering grace and peace by faith in his Son, because of Calvary, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 19 to 21. The dispensation of the grace of God is temporarily holding back the wrath, the tribulation. There is no preferred nation today. God is inviting all sinners to be reconciled to him by believing the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Believers can experience true grace and peace knowing that God, who cannot lie, has promised us eternal life, Titus 1 verse 2. Grace always comes before peace in Paul's writings. It is entirely by God's grace that he decided to save those who believe. Salvation is a gift of God not a work that we did, Ephesians 2 verse 8. 9. In fact, if we think that we contributed to our salvation in some way, we nullify it and make it of no effect, Romans 4 verses 5 and 14. We insult God if we say that Christ's death for our sins and resurrection was not enough and that something we did played a part in our salvation, such as water baptism, saying a prayer, our good works, and so on. Jesus paid it all. Believers will not be judged for their sins, they were judged on Calvary. Praise and thank you, Lord Jesus. We were spiritually dead, but we received the resurrection life of Jesus Christ in us freely, which made us spiritually alive unto God. Romans 6 verse 11, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 and 10, 11, Galatians 2 verse 20. It is the same for those in prophecy. Those of Israel are spiritually dead and life, for all is in Christ Jesus, John 1 verse 4. Peter and the eleven were in Christ, but they are not in the body of Christ. The twelve have a different destiny. They will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, Matthew 19 verse 28. We who are saved have all been given the ministry of reconciliation. Sinners will go to hell for their sins. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Galatians 3 verse 22. God can show mercy upon all. Romans 11 verse 32. Those who believe in Jesus Christ. Believers have Christ's imputed righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. We are all to be ambassadors for Christ to reconcile others to God. 2 Corinthians 5 colon 18 20. Christ made peace possible between God and sinners. Helping others to be saved is no easy task because Satan blinds lost people to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, Paul, Silas, and Timothy were obliged to always be thankful to God for them because their faith was growing exceedingly, and their charity, Christ's spirit in them, was abounding toward each other. Their prayers for the Thessalonians were being answered. 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12 Despite its problems, the church had shown great promise and steadfastness. Their faith and charity were evidence that Christ's sound doctrine to them through Paul was working. Their problems were that the church was being persecuted and wavering in their blessed hope, which could derail their faith. If we compare 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 with 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, we notice that Paul omits to praise their hope in this second letter. Even after the first letter, the church was still confused about the rapture. Paul writes to correct their misunderstanding. In the process, he emphasizes the importance of correcting doctrinal error. A long sentence begins at verse 3 and continues until the end of verse 10. For so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, Paul gloried in them as he told other churches about how their faith was holding up as they patiently endured persecution. Paul praises them for their great example to the other churches in Corinth and Sencria. Romans 16 verse 1, and other places. 
It was to God's glory that they were flourishing despite the persecution and tribulation that they were enduring. We need to remember that the little flock churches were also churches of God, but they preached the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of Christ. 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Paul acknowledges that they are suffering. True believers have suffered persecution throughout the ages. God counted them worthy to enter his heavenly kingdom because they trusted the gospel Paul preached. Remember the kingdom of God has two realms, heaven and earth. Their faith, charity, and patience in all their persecutions and tribulations were a manifest token that his spirit was in them. It will be righteous for God to reward them in the kingdom for which they suffer. They were continuing strong and enduring in Paul's doctrine despite hardships, which will make them worthy of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. They will be more suited for increased responsibility in their job positions in heaven because they were patient to endure persecution which caused their faith to grow. Jesus Christ was the greatest and bravest hero of all time. We love and admire the Lord Jesus Christ for his great courage in his costly sacrifice on our behalf. Romans 5 verse 8. We should have the courage to endure our light afflictions. Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Paul called what he endured light afflictions. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. He also said, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Colossians 1 verse 24. Most of us have not suffered much in comparison to our Lord or Paul. Paul suffered much more than most of us. He will probably hold a position similar to God's prime minister in heaven. Some of us have received the cold shoulder from family and friends because of our faith. Our suffering could still get worse on earth. The dispensation of grace will end in apostasy, not in revival. 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5, 3 12, 13, 4, colon 1 4. All suffering will be worth it all when we see Jesus. 6 Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, just as it is righteous for God to reward them, likewise it is righteous for God to recompense, repay, tribulation on those who trouble them. Their persecutors who caused them tribulation would suffer great tribulation if the imminent rapture happened. God alone is to judge unbelieving mankind and will at the great white throne judgment. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12 verse 19. We are not to render evil for evil. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 15. God is love, but he is also just. God's righteousness demands that he judges the unjust. Genesis 18 verse 25. God has laid up treasures of hail that he has reserved for the day of battle and war at his second coming. Job 38 verses 22 and 23. The Bible says that that hail will weigh as much as a talent of gold. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Revelation 16 verse 21. The order of events is the rapture, the tribulation, and then the second coming of Christ. 7. And to you who are troubled rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, Asterisk notice the comma after rest with us. The comma is a pause that separates the first part of the sentence from the second part. In this case, it separates their joy in heaven from Christ's judgment on the earth. Those believers who are troubled will rest with us in heaven after the rapture, while the Lord Jesus Christ recompenses the evil unbelievers. The body of Christ will have been caught up and will rest with God in the third heaven during the tribulation when the Lord Jesus comes with his mighty angels at his second coming. His second coming is the revelation of Jesus Christ, Revelation 1 verses 1 to 3. There are three sets of the sons of God, good angels, Job 38 verse 7, believing Israel, John 1 verse 12, 
1 John 3 verses 1 and 2, and the body of Christ, Romans 8 verses 14 and 19. At the rapture, the adoption, the redemption of our body, Romans 8 verse 23, the true believers are the heavenly sons of God, Romans 8 verse 19, who will be the ones that are caught up to heaven to meet the Lord in the air in the clouds. The earthly sons of God will be resurrected in the kingdom, John 5 verses 25 to 29. Understanding the Bible intellectually as historic or as literature is not the same as trusting in Christ's death for our sins and resurrection from the heart. Each person must be sure they are saved so they can lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12 Sons of God are set apart saints. They are set apart for God's glory because they trust in Him. Christ gave His heart to His Father by trusting Him and His Word, and sons of God do the same. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Proverbs 23 verse 26. The holy angels are set apart for God or saints. Jude 1 verses 14 and 15. Notice that Christ comes with his angels. Isaiah 13 verses 3 to 5. Matthew 25 verse 31. Revelation 19 verses 11 to 16. The Lord's army is his angels. Joel 2 verse 11. Jesus Christ is the Lord of an innumerable company of angels, Hebrews 12 verse 22. Angels are very strong and mighty. We know that just one angel killed 185,000 of the Assyrian army in one night, 2 Kings 19 verse 35. Eight in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the vengeance of God will. Come on those that know not God. They do not care to know their Creator, Romans 1 verses 18 to 21. They knew of God, but they were still spiritually dead, because they had not trusted His Word and did not have His Spirit in them, Romans 8 verse 9, Colossians 1 verse 27. Paul said, that I may know Him, Philippians 3 verse 10. God will avenge those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who will not believe the good news of our Lord in mystery or prophecy. To obey God in mystery is to believe what Christ says through his Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Believing the gospel Paul preached is not optional, we are commanded to believe that gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16 verse 31 is a command. Paul's my gospel is to be believed in this dispensation according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, Romans 16 verse 26. What exactly is the gospel we must believe to be saved? For I, Paul, delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that, by crucifixion, Christ died for our sins, Jews and Gentiles in mystery, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Paul said he was the due time testifier who testified that Christ died for all, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. 1 Timothy 2 verse 6. Both the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ began in Acts 9 when Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. Paul was the first member of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace to be saved. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. At his first coming, Christ came with love, mercy, and grace to seek and to save the lost sheep of Israel, Luke 19 verse 10. But at his second coming, Christ comes in judgment with vengeance, Hebrews 10 verse 30, Jude 7, Revelation 8 colon 7, 11 19, 14 colon 14 dash 20. There will be blood for 200 miles up to the horse bridles. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Revelation 14 verse 20 The Lord Jesus rightly divided at a comma between his first and second coming in Isaiah 61 verse 2, as stated in Luke 4 verse 19. The Lord will come in flaming fire at his second advent. And I saw the beast, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, 
and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, it necessitates a one-world currency, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Revelation 19 verses 19 and 20 Jesus Christ will execute wrath on unbelieving Jews and Gentiles, the nations, and Antichrist at the battle of Armageddon by the sword of his mouth and rained down fiery hail and brimstone that God has reserved for the day of battle, Job. 38, 27, Revelation 16 verses 13 to 16, 21, Revelation 19 verses 11 to 21. God will send down fire from heaven at the final rebellion after his first millennial reign, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 9. Satan will be locked up in hell for Christ's first millennial reign. There will be a crowd of evil worm like souls waiting for him that deceived them, Isaiah 14 verses 9 to 11. But Satan will be let loose for the final purging of the rebels. Then Satan will join the beast, Antichrist, and the false prophet who have already been tormented in the lake of fire for a thousand years. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Revelation 20 verse 10. 9 Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, the evildoers will be punished with everlasting destruction, not everlasting annihilation. Although Paul never mentioned the word hell, he describes it perfectly. Hell is a place of everlasting destruction. They are eternally separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Christ will judge the lost and decide on the degree of eternal torment at the great white throne judgment before hell is cast into the lake of fire, Romans 2 verse 6, Revelation 20 verse 14. Hell is currently in the heart of the earth, Matthew 12 verse 40, but it will be cast into the lake of fire, a gigantic trash which can be located at the bottom of the NIV, non-inspired version. Unbelievers who die in this dispensation will be judged at that time according to Paul's My Gospel, Romans 2 verse 16. The Lord's mighty power will be glorious to behold by his believers at his second coming. The believers will be waiting for him, possibly in the mountains of Petra, and they will admire him. 10 When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all of them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. When Christ comes to earth the second time, the believers who hope to live in his kingdom on earth will glorify and admire him. Many will believe because the body of Christ believed and was raptured. Paul's testimony of the rapture was true. At Christ's second coming believers in prophecy will be waiting for Jesus to arrive on earth. The mainly Jewish believers in prophecy will look forward to the day of the Lord, that day, as a blessing, Ephesians 3 verses 8 to 20. John 14 verse 3. Many will have believed in Christ because God kept his promise and raptured the body of Christ, Titus 1 verse 2. They will not believe other lies about why we disappeared such as the aliens stole us. The day of the Lord will be a day of horror for the unbelievers. They will ask the mountains and rocks to fall on them and cover them from the face of him, Luke 23 verse 30. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation 6 verse 16. Revelation 6 is an overview of the tribulation, but the believers in prophecy will be looking for him, Zechariah 12 verse 10. No signs precede the rapture, but many signs precede Christ's second coming to earth. It will be dark and the sign of the Son of Man will be dramatic. The sun and moon will be dark. He comes in, his glory with bright light in the darkness, every eye shall see him. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24 verses 29 and 30 
Stephen said that Israel did not recognize Joseph the first time they saw him, nor did they know Moses would deliver them until the second time he came. Likewise Israel will not recognize their Messiah until the second time he comes. Acts 7 13, 35 to 37, 51. Hebrews makes it clear that Christ is coming to the Hebrews for the second time. So, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9 verse 28. All of the Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ who came to do the Father's will. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Hebrews 10 verse 7. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yeah, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40 verse 8. 11 Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, and the work of faith with power. 12 That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul switches back to talking about the Thessalonians. The rapture has been at hand since Paul's day. If they had been caught up, their persecutors would have gone into the tribulation. Wherefore means for this reason that they will rest in heaven while their persecutors go into the tribulation to face Christ at his second coming. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are praying that they will be worthy to be in his kingdom. They do not pray that they would escape suffering, but that God's purpose would be accomplished through them. Paul and his companions always pray for the Thessalonians that God would count them worthy of their calling to be part of the kingdom of God in the heavenly places, 1 colon 5. That they would remain steadfast in the faith, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16 verse 25. There is one body, and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, Ephesians 4 verse 4. Paul wants them to be useful to God, so Christ's name will be glorified in them. Willing for Jesus Christ to live his life through them to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and his work of faith with his power in them. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2, Galatians 2 verse 20. It is all about Jesus. Christ, what he has done, and what he is doing through the believers. Before salvation we were spiritually dead. But after salvation we receive the life of Jesus in us. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 and 10, 11. The life of Jesus in us will function properly if we understand the mystery Christ gave us through Paul. We bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ when his power in us is doing the work. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We walk by faith in what God says in his word to and about us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Paul wants Christ to be glorified in them. Christ does the work by his power in us, so he receives the credit, and they are to be glorified in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by the grace of God that we have received his Spirit that does the work of God in and through us using the Word of God. It is such a joy that by his grace we are allowed to join in his glory plan to reconcile heaven and earth and to glorify and exalt his Son. The name of the Lord Jesus is glorified by him manifesting himself to the world through us, which is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1 verse 27. And the body of Christ are to the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1 verse 12. Martin Luther said, Today counts forever. Our service on earth is adding to his glory and our glory with him. We will be joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8 verse 17. Like Paul we glory in the cross of Christ. The world has lost its luster and pales in comparison to what our blessed Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6 verse 14.